Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, so welcome to the second session on uh, previous year question and important topics in OBS and Gaini. Last year, we had last, uh, sorry, last uh, Sunday, we had discussed uh, obstetrics. And today we're going to cover Gaini. We'll try to cover, um, uh, we're going to try to cover uh, mm -hmm. most of the last three years um, uh, papers. I think I have covered all of them in this session, along with some important topics, some very high yield areas, some of which are a little confusing. <clears throat> and we will also cover a lot of images. Okay. So this should be an interesting session. It will go a little long though. Like last time, two to three hours is, ex is the expected duration. Okay. So I think we are good to go. And uh, yeah, good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me? Am I audible? And last uh, last session, I was going through the, the chats and somebody had said, I forgot to mention Nepal. Yeah, I've worked in Nepal also for more than a year. Um, I was um, an assistant professor at the medical college at Pokhara there. So um, uh, those of you from Nepal also, uh, glad to see you. Okay, so I think we will start. Okay, so um, uh, we'll start with the gynae MCQs. Okay, these, as those of you are joining in now, we're discussing the last three year need PG question papers of gynae. We've already discussed obstetrics and those who are asking for the PDF, yes. So after this session is over, because my um, presentation has, has some videos also, those won't be able to, I won't be able to send those. So I'll remove all the videos and send the PDF um, tonight once the session is over. Okay. Uh, so I think we will start. Okay. So starting with gynae MCQs. A 16-year-old girl with a partial transverse vaginal septum presents with dysmenorrhea and chronic pelvic pain. Which of the following is she likely to have? Okay. So here you have a girl who has a partial transverse vaginal septum. Okay. And she presents with two symptoms, dysmenorrhea and chronic pelvic pain. Okay, so what do you think she has? Now, remember, whenever we talk about Mullerian anomalies, and remember, Mullerian anomalies are a very, very high yield area. Always a question is asked in the uh, last, I think, last NEAT PG, or was it the one before? At least five questions came just from Mullerian anomalies. It's a very frequently asked question. You should be very thorough. So we will discuss a few questions on Mullerian. Now, in Mullerian anomalies, when we talk about TVS, a transverse vaginal septum, it's basically, this is the uterus, this is the vagina, this is the septum in the vagina. And any anomaly which is like this, which is an obstructive, so this is an obstructive Mullerian anomaly. Obstructive to what? Obstructive to the outflow of blood. Okay, so a girl, and she has a partial transverse septum. If she had a complete septum, what do you think she would have presented with? Partial means there's some break there, so she is able to get her period. Okay, but if it is a complete septum, then she would have presented with primary amenorrhea or cryptomenorrhea. That means she's having bleeding, but the blood is not coming out. So what's called cryptomenorrhea should present with cyclical dysmenorrhea. Okay, but here we have a girl who's having her period, but because the septum is partial, there is obstruction and backflow of blood to the uterus to the tubes and out through the tubes into the peritoneal cavity. So there will be some amount of, there may be hematocorpus, there may be hematometra, there may be hepatosalpings. And because of this retrograde menstruation, what is happening? Endometriosis will happen. Okay. So endometriosis and what are the, what are the symptoms of endometriosis? How do we remember this? Remember the five Ds. Okay. And this has also come as a question in the INICT last time. What are the five Ds of endometriosis? The first is dysmenorrhea. Okay. The second D is dull, aching, pain. Okay. The third D is dyspareunia or painful intercourse. The fourth D is dyschezia or painful defecation. And the fifth D is just to make it a D, it is dysfertility or infertility. So five Ds of endometriosis, these are the most common symptoms. Remember, AUB may happen, but it is not a definitive symptom. Okay, so these are the five symptoms of endometriosis, dysmenorrhea, dull aching or chronic pelvic pain, dyspareunia, dyschezia, dysfertility. Okay, one of the etiology of endometriosis is an obstructive Mullerian anomaly. Okay. 
So the same thing written here, there could be three types of septum. What is the treatment of a septum? What do you do? If the question comes, how will you treat this? You will do an excision of the septum. Okay, from below, we vaginally, we excise the septum. Okay, and then we put in a graft here so that the vagina doesn't close again. Okay, so it remains patent. Okay. Next question, and this is a very easy question. A 29-year-old woman is undergoing evaluation for infertility. The following test is done. What is this test? Okay, and this is very obvious. This is a histrosalpingogram. Okay, this is the correct answer. And what is the anomaly seen here? What is this seen? This is a unicornuate uterus. <clears throat> Remember the investigation of choice in a Mullerian anomaly is what? What is the investigation of choice? Okay, somebody saying hysteroscopic resection. Hysteroscopic resection is for a septa, not for a transverse vaginal septum. All right, that's important to understand. Okay, so what will you, what is the investigation of choice for a Mullerian anomaly? This is again a bit controversial, but the best non-invasive investigation for a Mullerian anomaly is an MRI. Okay, 3D scans are now coming up. Some books, amongst amongst all the books I read, uh, some books, most books say MRI. Two or three places they are saying 3D scans have now replaced MRI. But for all practical purposes, MRI remains the best non-invasive investigation of choice for a Mullerian anomaly. Okay. Next question. A 28-year-old P0A3 with recurrent second trimester abortions was found to have a septa on a SSG. What is a SSG? It is similar to an HSG, but we use an ultrasound is the imaging used, not an X-ray. Okay. What is the best management option? Will you do a DNC? Will you do a laparoscopic metroplasty? Will you do a hysteroscopic septal dissection? Or will you do a laparotomy and a metroplasty? What will you do? So the answer would be you will do a hysteroscopic septal dissection. Just a Sorry, okay. So the correct answer is you'll do a hysteroscopic septal resection. Okay. Now, what is uh, uh, what is this basically? Okay, so a septal, I have, I have some pictures, I think, and images later on. So a septate uterus is basically when the two Mullerian ducts have fused. Okay, but the septa, which is in the middle, fails to dissolve. Okay, and what are the symptoms a septate uterus can have? she can present with recurrent pregnancy loss. So she can have a lot of bad obstetric outcome. How? She can have recurrent abortions. She can have preterm labor. She can have mid-trimester abortions. She can have IUGR. Okay, she can have infertility. So septate uterus does not usually have a good obstetric outcome. And the treatment of choice is through a hysteroscope. We simply cut the septa. The septa is usually avascular with a scissors or a resectoscope, we just cut the septa. Okay. Next question. A 28-year-old woman uh, being evaluated for infertility was found to have a uterine didelphis on the 3D scan. All are possible complications except. Okay. Now, didelphis, remember, okay, is like this. Completely separate uteruses, completely separate services. Okay. There is no communication whatsoever. Now, remember, didelphis usually has a good obstetric outcome. It usually doesn't cause much problems, okay? But yes, abortions are seen. Yes, preterm labor can be seen, okay? Now, both these things are rare in didelphis, okay? So, there is again a controversy in this question, okay? Malpresentations also are very rare. Endometriosis is also very rare because it is not an obstructive anomaly. Okay, there are two separate uteruses. But here I would go with transverse lie. Endometriosis can rarely be seen in something called as the Ovira syndrome, which is seen in uterine didelphis. What is Ovira syndrome? OHV stands for obstructed hemi vagina, and IRA stands for ipsilateral renal agenesis. So there's obstruction in, this is the vagina, there's obstruction in one of the vagina, okay, and this leads to endometriosis, okay, and on the same side, the kidney won't be there, okay, so this is the ovira syndrome. 
which is a very rare form of uterine didelphis. So that's why the correct answer here should be a malpresentation. Because if you read the books, especially Williams, which is our gold standard book, malpresentations is not mentioned as a complication of uterine didelphis. Okay. Okay. Now, this is again a common area. What is this anomaly? Is this a set? So this is a HSG again. Okay. And it looks either like a septate or a biconvoid, but how do we differentiate between the between both of them? And also, how do the other two look like? We've already seen how uniconate uterus looks like. How does a didelphus look like? How does a biconvoid look like? How does a septate uterus look like? What is this? This is yes. So I'm getting in the answers again. This, so there's a confusion in this. Okay. So is this septate or is this biconvoid? So far, we're 50 50 in the answers. This is actually a septate uterus okay now remember hsg has very poor sensitivity in determining the differentiating between a septate and a biconic uterus which is not a good investigation in fact it's a very bad investigation okay but you get questions from here because it is the initial investigation when you're evaluating a woman okay so what what we see in the hsg is this angle this is the inter Cornual angle. If this intercornual angle is less than 75 degrees, as you can see in this picture, it is a septate uterus. If the angle is obtuse, more than 105 degree, in fact, quite obtuse, it is a bicornuit uterus. Okay, so don't get confused. If the angle is very wide, it is a bicornuit. If the angle is very narrow, it is a it is a septate. Yes, CD scan will help. I'll come to that also. How it helps. Okay. But remember, this is a septate uterus. Okay, <clears throat> how will a didelphus look like? Didelphus will have no communication. Here you can see this communication. A didelphus will have zero communication. There'll be completely two separate different horns. Okay. Now let's talk a bit about Mullerian anomalies because this keeps coming. The most, the first one is Mullerian agenesis. Okay, also known as mayer rokitansky kuster hauser syndrome. Okay, so this is... How will this present or what is it? This is complete or partial absence of the uterus, the cervix, the fallopian tubes and the upper two-third of the vagina because these are all formed from the Mullerian duct. Okay, so these are completely absent in MRKH syndrome. So how will the patient present to us? Okay, somebody is asking any other difference between NB? No, I'll come to how you differentiate in a 3D scan. But in our, on our HSG, this is the only way you can differentiate is by a by seeing the intercornual angle. Nothing else can help us differentiate in a septate uterus and a bicornuate uterus. Okay, how does MRKH present? It will present with primary amenorrhea. Will she or will she not have secondary sexual characters? Will she or will she not have secondary sexual characters? She will have, okay, so primary and amenorrhea in the presence of secondary sexual characters. Why? Because the ovaries are normal and we've got a separate topic on primary amenorrhea, but I'll just put this here. If the secondary sexual characters are present. That means breast development is there, pubic hair is there, axillary hair is there. That means ovaries are there and they are functioning. Okay, so primary amenorrhea in the presence of secondary sexual characters, one of the things you will think of is Mullerian agenesis. Okay, also remember skeletal and renal anomalies are usually associated with MRKH syndrome. Okay. And how will you investigate her? So if a woman girl comes to you secondary with sorry with secondary sexual characters present and with primary amenorrhea, the first thing you will look for is the presence or the absence of a uterus. So you will do an ultrasound to determine the presence or absence of a uterus. If the uterus is absent, okay, you will diagnose her to have MRKH syndrome. The other possibility if the uterus is absent and similar presentation is androgen insensitivity syndrome. So I won't discuss this too much here. We'll come on our questions on primary amenorrhea where we have, where we will discuss this. Okay. Now remember in MRKH, how do we treat MRKH? What are the options we have? In MRKH, remember this girl who comes to us with primary amenorrhea, okay, with a small vagina, we need to give her 
two things. We need to give a sexual function. And how do we do that? By doing what is called a vaginoplasty. That means we create a or increase the length of the vagina surgically or by using vaginal dilators. Okay. And the second thing is we need to give her fertility. So how can we give this girl fertility? What can we do? Yes. So somebody is asking, can MRKH become pregnant? Okay. So in very recent times, yes, they can become pregnant. They can become pregnant two ways. Okay. One way is by a gestational surrogate because their ovaries are fine. And this is the more common way we get them pregnant is the ovaries are fine. So we get them a gestational surrogate. Okay. And the second way and the more recent way, a lot of recent advance in this is by a uterine transplant. Okay. So Mullerian anomaly is one of the most common indications for a, Mullerian, for a uterine transplant. And uh, I, I'm saying it as if many have been done, but all the world over only around 100 tran transplants have been done. In India, one has been done in 2018 at Galaxy Hospital in Pune. Okay. And that lady had an IVF because you can't conceive otherwise. So she had an IVF, she had a baby, she had a successful cesarean. So that all that happened. Okay. And one transplant has been, that is the one transplant that plant has been reported in India. Okay. So MRKH syndrome is one of the common indications for a uterine transplant. Okay. So two ways she can get pregnant, surrogacy and uterine transplant. Okay. Now, a little bit about unicornuate uterus. This is a unicornuate uterus on HSG. Only a single horn is there. Okay. What do you need to remember about this? Remember that majority of them will have what is called a rudimentary horn. Okay. The rudimentary horn may be functional. Okay. It may be communicating or it may be non-functional. It may be non-communicating. Okay. So here you can have, you have a functional communicating horn. Here you have a functional non-communicating. Here you don't have a functional, but it's a horn is there and here you have no horn. So I say the majority, remember this, the majority will have a rudimentary horn. And if a rudimentary functioning horn is there, it needs to be removed. Why? Because it can lead to endometriosis. Hematometra in this horn can collect. And if this tube is functional, what can happen? An ectopic pregnancy in the rudimentary horn can happen and this can lead to rupture uterus. And this rupture happens usually around 18 to 20 weeks of pregnancy, not like the usual tubal rupture which occurs earlier. Okay. So remember rudimentary horn, if it's there, it needs to be excised if it is functional because she can have endometriosis, hematometra and a pregnancy in the rudimentary horn called an ectopic pregnancy in the rudimentary horn, which needs to be removed. Okay. Otherwise it will rupture. Now, this is the picture I was showing you of a septate uterus. This is a hysteroscopy picture. Remember, whenever you're looking inside the cavity, it is a hysteroscopy. Okay, when you're, when you're looking intra-abdominally, it is a laparoscopy. Okay, this is a hysteroscopy picture. And what do we do when we see this picture? We have to, we have to resect it. Okay, so we resect the septa when we are doing, when we see this, this is a septate uterus. Okay. This is a resectoscope. This image is of a resectoscope. The resectoscope is cutting the septa. Okay. This has cautery. This has energy running through it and it cuts the septa. You can also use a simple scissors that will also cut the septa. Okay. This is what I was showing a uterine dielphus. So remember, these are all images. They can come as images. Okay. Then you can see, I was just seeing the questions. Okay, so this is a, this can come as an image-based question. It's come in the past. It can come again. Okay, remember, you may not actually see two Leach Wilkinson cannulas here. Okay, so don't rely on that as a diagnosis. Rely on two completely separate cavities. No communication at all between the two cavities. The cavities are ending here. There's no communication at all. Remember, didelphus, it has the best reproductive outcome. Amongst all the reproduct all the Mullerian anomalies, best reproductive outcome is with a uterine didelphus. Okay. This is a bicornate uterus. Can you see the angle here now compared to the septate uterus? This angle is more than 105 degrees. It's an obtuse angle. Okay. An acute angle, an angle like this is seen in a septate uterus. Okay. <clears throat> Now, how do you treat a bicornate uterus if she is symptomatic, if she is having bad obstetric history? Surgical reconstruction can be done. 
and this is called a metroplasty where you can see both the horns have been brought together okay and sutured in the middle this is called a metroplasty okay jones metroplasty strassman metroplasty all these things are there okay somebody is asking will hysteroscopy differentiate no only hysteroscopy won't differentiate between septal and bicornuate it has to be a histro laparoscopy which will differentiate okay lapro histro is required not only a hysteroscopy because in a hysteroscopy again you will get confused you'll see a septa you don't know if it is a bicornuate or a septate uterus okay now here is the hsg now tell me which one is which what is a what is b what is c now i think it's simple what is this this is a is a a is a septate uterus okay b is a bicornuate uterus okay and c is a uterus didelphis all right now this is uh, this has never been asked but this is a potential question okay so please no, uh, listen to this carefully this is an image of what this is an image of a 3d ultrasound okay and a 3d ultrasound is now proving to be very very beneficial in diagnosing mullerian anomalies okay because it is not expensive and easily done also it is soon going to replace mri as the investigation of choice but for all practical purposes remember mri still remains the best investigation for mullerian anomalies okay now how do we differentiate based on this what is what okay now the first two see the first two the first two can you see this is the outline of the uterus the red that i have drawn okay and can you see this line this line is connecting the two uterine horns. This is one uterine horn. This is one uterine horn. So the line drawn between the two uterine horns, if it is bisecting the fundal, the fundal dimple or the indentation of the fundus, uterine fundus, if the line drawn between the two horns of the uterus is crossing or is less than five millimeters, okay, if this line is less than five millimeter from the fundal of the fundus the deep the fundus the indentation of the fundus then this is a bicornuate uterus so it's either cutting through or the distance is very less it is le less than five millimeter it is a bicornuate uterus if this distance between the outline of the uterus this is the fundus and this line joining the two cornua is more than five millimeter it is a septate uterus. Okay, so this is how you differentiate on a 3D scan between septate and bicornuate uterus. Remember this, okay? We won't go into too much details. Don't start thinking too much. Just remember if it's cutting through or if the distance is less than 5 millimeter between the two, that is the line joining the two cornua and the fundal indentation, it is bicornuate if this distance is more than five millimeter it is a septate uterus okay so this is on a 3d scan potential question potential mm -hmm. image based or clinical question it's never been asked they've all been asking hsgs this is something that they might move on to because this is now very very commonly being done okay next question a 16 year old girl presents to the opd with a history of primary amenorrhea and cyclical pain Okay, perineal examination reveals a bulge protruding from the vagina. Identify the cause of this presentation. So this is quite easy. What is this? So primary amenorrhea with cyclical pain. Okay, this is called as cryptomenorrhea. The two causes of cryptomenorrhea are a transverse septum and an imperforate hymen. How do you differentiate between them? On clinical examination, the imperforate hymen, you'll see a bluish bulge on a local examination. So this is an imperforate hymen. Okay. Now, this is how the bulge looks like. This is an image-based question which can come. Okay, so with every question, I'll try to cover what all can be asked around this. This can come. And what is the management? What is this called? This is called giving a cruciate incision. Cruciate means cross-shaped. Okay, so what do we do? Through the bulging hymen here, we give an incision like this. Now, when we give this incision, four flaps are formed. So this flap we suture here, this flap here, this flap here, and this flap here. All the collected blood comes out and the hymen remains open. Okay. So this is, what is this? This is not hematometra. This is hematocolpos. Okay. So remember, whenever there's an obstruction, first hematocolpos will form. That is blood in the vagina. 
if nothing is done it will go on to form hematometra which is blood in the uterus then hematosalpinx and then endometriosis okay so that is what usually happens okay so this is hematocolpus which is causing the bluish bulge seen okay we've already discussed tvs okay now this is also a question it's hardly ever seen okay i, I have rare, seen i think two or three cases of des induced reproductive tract abnormalities but it's such a favorite question that the examiners like to ask mainly because this is an ideal example of a teratogenic drug okay like like also thalidomide okay so thalidomide and des are classical classical examples of teratogenic drugs okay now in the 1940s to 60s a little bit of history okay because that makes things interesting a bit women who had recurrent pregnancy losses like recurrent abortions recurrent preterm labor they were started on des diethylsilbestrol which is an estrogen okay and this would support the pregnancy okay so but what was found that girls and boys born to des mothers they are called des daughters and des sons of course these uh, people are now quite old i mean they are 60 70 years old now because this was very long back but many of these were found to have abnormalities okay the daughters des girls girl babies born to these mothers who were exposed to des were found to have this this when they they would present with infertility later on when an hsg was done this is called a t shaped uterus okay so t shaped uterus was seen in these girls and the sons the boys what did they have the boys had hypospadias okay was found okay so micro penis hypospadia so basically external genital abnormalities were found and also des daughters were found to have a higher incidence of clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina and the cervix okay so clear cell adenocarcinoma is otherwise very rare but it was found to be increasingly common in this in this group of people okay so remember these all have come as a question T shaped uterus has come as a question. Hypospadias has come as a question. Clear cell adenocarcinoma has come as a question. That's why I'm spending some time here. It's very, very, very important. Okay. So, DES, although rare, hardly see it now, but it's important. Okay. Next question. A 28 year old woman is undergoing evaluation for successive recurrent pregnancy losses. On ultrasound, a mullerian normally is suspected. What is the best way to confirm this? Okay. Now, remember what did we discuss? We discussed the best non-invasive investigation of choice is an MRI. Okay. But if you're asked what is the best way to confirm this, not non-invasive, then it would be a hysteroscopy and laparoscopy. Okay. In fact, MRI was not given in this answer in these options. Uh, it was not given at all. So it makes your job much easier not to get confused. If it's asked best investigation, please mark MRI. If it is asked best way or best non-invasive, invest sorry, best invasive investigation or best way to diagnose it is you will do a hysteroscopy and a laparoscopy to confirm the Mullerian anomaly. Okay. Is that clear again? Okay. So MRI, if they're asked non-invasive, Okay, or if they ask best investigation of choice, then mark an MRI because histrolapro is not really an investigation. It is a procedure. Okay. This came in last year in EPG. Identify the type of hymen. What is this? This is a... Okay, between MRI and invasive. So it depends. Somebody is asking which is the best between MRI and invasive. So I would say histrolapro is the best because you're actually seeing what is inside. Okay, it's better than an MRI also, but also remember that the, the question will be very clearly framed what they're trying to ask. Like in the question that was asked, MRI was not even an option. Okay, this is a septate hymen. Very good. So very straightforward question, nothing much to it. But remember images, lots and lots of images. Jitne images parhoge, utna better hai. Jitne, you go through your books and see, and I put a lot of images in this. In fact, if you just go through the OBS and the gynae, I think all images, all possible images have been covered. Okay. Different types of hymen. I don't think we need to go through this. So annular cribiform, septate, imperforate is important. It's come as a question. Now septate has also come as a question. Okay. Now let's move on to the next topic that is contraception. Okay. Now contraception is again a very important area. 
okay it is um, uh, again a must know it is one area you can't afford to miss because uh in our country na family planning pe bahut zyada emphasis hai so they will ask you about contraception okay now which is a contra indication to this what is this first of all anyone what is this i think in your psm lectures you would already be very thorough with this what is this okay everybody selling me the answer but what is this what is this what is this image of and don't say it's a copper t i want to know which type of copper t is it or which type of intrauterine copper device is it yes i all know the answer is yes it's a multi load very good i was just patiently waiting this is a multi load okay it is different from a copper t 380a because can you see these serrations here and the shape it's like this the shape is like this this is a multi load this can come just as a question itself okay so copper t 375 or multi load okay now what is a contraindication to this remember it can the, the rest are just to confuse you okay it can be put after delivery post placental we all know ppiucd is now the norm in most government uh, hospitals okay it can be used as emergency contraception it can even be put during menstruation okay but remember malignancy is a complete contraindication to putting in an intrauterine device okay this is the mnemonic to remember you can't get pregnant if you have an iucd these are the absolute contraindications of a intrauterine device okay what does mec4 mean what does mec stand for mec stands for medical eligibility criteria okay and this is important to know again this is a potential question what is medical eligibility criteria mean so the who for every contraception or for every contraceptive they have given an mec for every medical complication or any problem the woman has if so if she's breastfeeding if she has heart disease if she has a malignancy so for every known contraceptive there is okay or at least the most common ones they have divided into four categories of mec mec1 2 3 and 4 one means that it is completely indicated you can use the the contraceptive in any condition okay two means it is the benefits of using the method outweigh the risks okay three means it is relatively contraindicated the risks outweigh the benefits and four means you should not use this at all okay so mec4 that means absolute contraindications you should know for all the contraceptive devices okay so what is mec4 what are the absolute contraindications for an intrauterine copper device or intrauterine contraceptive device i would say because this includes mirena also so you can't get pregnant so pregnancy is one number one is pregnancy if you have an iucd what is i i is infection isme sab aa jayega postpartum sepsis post abortal sepsis active pid genital tuberculosis ye sab infection mein aa jata hai theek hai you is undiagnosed genital bleeding till you know why she is having abnormal bleeding don't put in an iucd third is c is for cancer or malignancy and so endometrial cancer isme aata hai cervical cancer aata hai gestational trophoblastic disease bhi aata hai isme and this d is for distorted cavity large fibroids or a mullerian anomaly so anything which is distorting the cavity becomes d so easy mnemonic you can't get pregnant if you have an iucd so pregnant and iucd are the things you need to remember okay these are mec4 absolute contraindications okay now remember when all can you put in an iucd you can put in an iucd let's start with the girl a woman comes and she has just delivered so post delivery okay now in post delivery you can put in an iucd when all you can put in an iucd post placental what does this mean this means within 10 minutes of delivery okay the second time you can put in an intrauterine device is when you can put in a second time intrauterine device you can put it after delivery when can you do it you can do an early post partum insertion that means less than 48 hours before you send her home within 48 hours if you miss the 10 minute period see she says doctor i'm not sure i need to discuss with my family so before she goes home you can still put in an intrauterine device okay 
and you can also put one intra cesarean okay so it doesn't have to be following a vaginal delivery you can also put in a intrauterine device during the cesarean section so three times post delivery or during delivery immediately after within 10 minutes this is called as post placental early postpartum or intra cesarean suppose she's gone home after delivery when can you put it you can put the next time you have is late postpartum that means after six weeks when she comes for her postpartum visit that time you can counsel her and put in an intrauterine contraceptive device the who says you can put it after four weeks okay so we usually we usually put it in six weeks because this is when the patient comes to us for follow-up so government of india says six weeks WHO source says any time after four weeks also, but between 48 hours to four weeks, you should not put in the IUCD because the uterus is actively retracting. Okay, so it can push the chances of expulsion are very high if you put it in between this time. Okay, when else can you put in an intrauterine device? You can put it interval. Interval means any time as long as you are reasonably sure she is not pregnant. Okay, that means. That means, and usually we do, do this, the ideal time is post-menstrual, okay, but it's not necessary. It can be put like in the question that was asked, it can be put even during a, her period. But you should just be reasonably sure that she is not pregnant. That is why we prefer to put it post-menstrually, okay? And then we can also put it post-abortal, following a first trimester MTP or a second trimester MTP also, but the chances of expulsion again are higher if it is a second trimester MTP. Okay, so these are the recommended timings of insertion of an intrauterine device. This is a possible potential question. It's very important. Okay, this can come as an image-based question. What is this? This is the WHO, what I was talking about, the WHO medical eligibility criteria wheel okay it is available as an app free of cost in your phones if you just go on the play store you can download this app and you have six main contraceptives the copper iucd the lng marina the implant dmpa progesterone only pills and all the combined contraceptives okay so six of them are described okay and here you have the medical conditions if she's hiv positive if she has a sexually transmitted disease pid sepsis there's so many of them it's an entire wheel okay only part of it is shown here okay but this is called the mec wheel and as, as i said you have four so you have one two three four you have uh, so it, if it's one, if the wheel shows one, that means that method is absolutely indicated for that medical condition. If it's two, the you can still use it. The benefits outweigh the risks. Three, relatively contraindicated. Four, absolutely contraindicated. In other words, if it is one or two, you can use it. If it is three or four, you should not use that contraceptive method. Okay. Okay, next question. A 28-year-old woman who delivered 80, and this was one of the questions last NEET PG, which many of you got confused. She delivered 18 months back and is breastfeeding. Okay. 18 months, months back means one and a half years back. Okay. And she seeks contraceptive advice. Her periods are irregular and heavy. What would be the best contraceptive for her? Okay. See the options. What is given? Progesta cert is given. N-E-T-E-N is given. Okay, that is nor estrogen enanthate. Okay, mala and these are both progesterone containing contraceptives. Mala N is an estrogen plus progesterone, and copper T three eighty A is an intrauterine device. Okay, so here is where the controversy came. See, some are saying progesterone, or some are saying mala N. Now remember here, one thing we we will definitely not put in a copper T, right? Because she's already having heavy periods. Copper T will increase. So, copper T intrauterine devices cause menorrhagia in some women, okay, which may settle down with time. But since she's having heavy bleeding, it's not a good option, okay. What is the best option here? The answer is Mala N. Okay, many of you may say she's breastfeeding, but that is just to confuse you. See the time. She's 18 months, one and a half years post-delivery. The baby will hardly be taking any breastfeeds, okay, if at all. And number two, remember, after six months, in a breastfeeding woman, you can safely give OC pills. Okay. The contraindication is only when she's exclusively breastfeeding, that is less than six months, is when it is category 
four when you can't give in fact it's category three you can't give oc pills combined oc pills if she is exclusively breastfeeding after six months you can safely give combined oral contraceptive pills why are we preferring cocs because she's having irregular heavy bleeding what do cocs do cocs cause regular periods and they will reduce the bleeding. They reduce the flow. So that's, that's very important. Giving progester cert or a progesterone only pill, okay, or an, any any progesterone, okay, all the progesterone containing contraceptives will not correct her irregularity. In fact, they all cause irregular periods. Most of them will cause spotting in between, okay, and irregular cycles are a known side effect of progesterone containing contraceptives. Okay, so here. Combined OC pills are the answer. These questions, this breastfeeding here is just there to confuse you. Okay, so please read the question carefully. Don't jump at the answer. See 18 months back. So that is the clue in this question. Okay. So progesterone contraceptives cause endometrial atrophy and a lot of breakthrough bleeding. So if she's the amount of bleeding will reduce, she won't have heavy cycles, but the irregularity will remain that is why cocs are best for her because they will maintain the regularity okay now let's just talk about postpartum contraception kya de sakte hain kya nahi de sakte hain remember cocs we've discussed in non breastfeeding mothers if she's not breastfeeding aap 3 hafte ke baad start kar sakte ho preferably after 6 weeks because they increase the risk of thromboembolism immediate postpartum thromboembolism hota hai to 6 hafte ke baad you can start if she is not breastfeeding okay but in breastfeeding mothers start after 6 months okay why we don't give in breastfeeding mothers because estrogen reduces the quality and the quantity of breast milk okay progesterone only pills can be given in both breastfeeding and non-breastfeeding mothers, preferably start again after six weeks. Okay. DMPA, what is DMPA? DMPA is Antara. Okay. It is an injectable progesterone ejection depomedroxy progesterone acetate available by the government of India by the name Antara. Okay. In non-breastfeeding mothers, you can start on the day of delivery. Immediately after also you can give her. And in breastfeeding mothers, after six weeks. Okay. Mirina kab de sakte hai? Remember kya bola tha maine? Any intrauterine device, you can give it either within the 48 hours, including Mirina, or after four to six weeks. Four to six weeks, you like her maine? Because in, uh, our guidelines say four weeks for our intrauterine device. The, uh, sorry, our guidelines say six weeks. WHO says four weeks. And same for copper. IUCD. Okay. So this is irrespective of breastfeeding or non-breastfeeding. The only concern for breastfeeding mothers is the estrogen plus progesterone combination. This is again a very important slide. Okay. Yes. So those who are joining, you will get the PDF. Why I didn't share earlier? Because it has some videos and I can't share. A, I, I would have to remove the videos to share the PDF. So once this session is over, I will remove the videos and I will share the PDF. Okay. Next question. Okay, so Reema Devi, a 28-year-old newly married woman, presents to your sub-center for contraceptive advice. She is started on oral contraceptive pills. She presents after two weeks with a history of missing four tablets on different days in the first two weeks of the cycle. So what will you advise her? Okay, so this is a case of a missed pill. Okay, and she's missed four pills. So what will you tell her? Will you discontinue the packet and start an alternate method of contraception? Take four tablets the next day, continue the remaining packet, use additional contraception and give emergency pill. Take the next pill as soon as possible, continue the remaining packet, use additional contraception and give the e-pill. Take the next pill as soon as possible and continue the remaining tablet. So what will you do? Yes, somebody is asking, can you start POP just after delivery? Yes, you can. Okay, it is category two just after delivery, but it is category one. That means completely indicated after six weeks of delivery. Okay, so see, again, this is a confusing question. Let me clear your doubts. Okay, the answer is not A, the answer is C. Okay, now why is it C? Let us discuss. Okay, now if you have a patient who has one missed pill, okay, what will you do if she has one missed pill? Kya karoge? It doesn't affect contraceptive efficacy that much. The missed pill should be taken as soon as possible. So she remembers, oh, I've forgotten yesterday's pill. What should I do? Take that pill as soon as she has remembered that she's forgotten and continue the remaining packet. No additional contraception is required if she's missed just one pill. Okay. But if she's missed two or more pills, 
that is she is more than 48 hours late what will you do so two or more missed pills you need to first explain to her ki contraceptive efficacy ab itna nahi raha hai. there is a small chance you can get pregnant but to prevent this what should you do the last pill should be taken as soon as possible there's this patient Reema Devi she forgot four pills okay so what should she do now the last pill when she comes to you at, your, at the sub center you're a resident there what will you do tell her that the last pill is now take it then leave the earlier baki teen chhod do leave the earlier three missed pills okay use a condom for seven days okay and so this is this is this has to be done take one the last missed pill use additional contraception and further to reduce the risk of pregnancy what should she do if the pills were missed in the first week okay so 21 tablets in the first week if the pill was missed consider giving her emergency contraception so what do we do we give her lng 150 microgram a single tablet is emergency contraception okay if the pills were missed in the second week no need for emergency contraception why because what do oc pills do they inhibit ovulation okay the cohort of growing follicles will be recruited in the first few days of the cycle okay and that is why if the pills are missed in the first week to prevent that cohort of the the, the to, pre to prevent the dominant follicle from being chosen we have to give extra progesterone to suppress it okay but if pills are mixed in, mixed in the second week, no need for emergency contraception because most likely the dominant follicle has not formed because she's been taking it in the first week. Okay. But if pill is missed in the third week, what will happen is omit the pill free interval. Okay. That means the one week gap hum dete hai, usko na deke, tell her to start a new packet after finishing the current packet. This is again to prevent so what happens is the cohort of dominant follicles actually starts in the previous cycle the last few days premenstrual okay so to prevent ovulation happening in the next cycle you remove you ask her to leave out the pill free interval and start a new packet immediately this is what is done if there are two or more missed pills okay is this clear let's see again if one missed pill kushni kana take the pill and continue the packet if two or more missed pills what should she do take the last one continue the remaining packet use a condom for seven days and apart from that if the pills were missed in the first week give her an emergency contraceptive second week nothing else needs to be done third week what should she do omit the pill free interval and start the new packet immediately so one week ka gap nahi dena hai. now read this question okay for those of you who didn't get it read the question now so she missed four tablets on different days in the first two weeks so what should we do without seeing the answers first form the answer in your head don't get confused okay so that's what i keep saying don't get confused with such clinical questions now especially the long ones when you read them think of the answer before seeing the options because once you see the options you start getting confused okay and the options some of them are very the, the in fact one option is called the answer baki teen ko hum kya kehte hain baki teen ko hum kehte hain distractors okay when we form mcqs when we write mcqs we are all trained to make mcqs ek ka answer ek stem hota hai this is the stem okay one is the correct option and baki teen distractors hote to hame samjhaya jata when we have our medical education classes as faculty hame samjhaya jata hai ki similar options banao taki bachcha confuse ho jaye that is what we are that is how questions are actually made okay the purpose is to confuse you but if you are thorough with your knowledge if you know the answer you should not get confused and you should mark the correct answer okay so the answer is see are we clear on this very important concept missed pill okay moving on okay these are quickly we'll quickly now some images are there we'll quickly take you through them what is this this is a female condom it has two rims on either side okay so this is how a female condom looks like this is how a cervical diaphragm looks like okay these are image based questions so i'm just showing you the images okay this is how a cervical cap looks like not much to them okay so we'll just take you through what is this this is a spermicide commonly available in the name of today it contains nonoxinol 9 okay okay so somebody is asking why can't they take tablet in this is why waste medication because she'll get confused remember many in in, in a practical scenario 
इफ यू एवर सीन दी ओ सी पिल ना उसपे पीछे लिखा होता है मंडे ट्यूजडे वेंसडे थर्सडे फ्राइडे बिकॉज इट्स वेरी कॉमन ली कॉमन टू गेट कंफ्यूज की कौन सा पिल कब लेना है सो इट्स ओके फॉर गेट वेस्टेज she should not get pregnant that's more important is lay start a new packet okay now this is a new potential question okay potential question this is an image based question can anyone tell me what this is it's written fexi what is fexi it's not available in india but it's available abroad what is this this is a vagina it's a contraceptive it's a vaginal ph regulator okay so it changes the ph of the vagina it is a foamy substance when introduced okay it in, it it in, it uh, um, releases a foamy substance okay and this changes the ph of the vagina okay and it makes it in uh, it makes it basically makes it inhospitable to the sperm okay so new potential question fexi new contraceptive it's a female contraceptive it is a vaginal ph regulator okay what are these this is copper t 380a available by the government of india free of cost important to remember the life span is 10 years okay this is a revision i'm sure psm it's also done what is this we already discussed multi load okay multi load ka life span kitna hai 5 years okay copper t 380a kyun hai because it has copper on the arms and 380 is the amount of copper wiring okay marine uh, sorry multi load is this one it doesn't have copper on the arms okay it has a serrated sort of Uh, arms which appear like this okay this is actually copper t 375 okay what is this this is mala n okay mala n is the is, is the contraceptive freely available by the government of india it contains estrogen plus progesterone okay remember that mala d jo hai what is the difference in mala n and mala d mala d remember is available at 3 rupees per packet it is the only difference is this is this comes at a cost mala n is freely supplied okay and also remember that it contains seven tablets of ferrous sulfate so seven iron tablets so it's a complete 28 day pack 21 tablets of estrogen plus progesterone and seven tablets of iron so that there is no break in the continuity she keeps having a tablet okay and she doesn't have to actually remember okay what is this this is the vaginal ring this is also contains estrogen sorry estrogen plus progesterone okay and it what is the estrogen the estrogen is ethanol estradiol the progesterone is etonorgestrel if i am not mistaken okay so etonorgestrel is the progesterone how does this how does this work it works on the same basis as a oral contraceptive pill the only difference is she wears it for 3 weeks and then takes it out for one week where she will get her period and then she puts in a new ring in the next cycle so it's 3 weeks on one week off is how it is used okay transdermal contraceptive patch available by the name of ortho evra okay this also contains estrogen plus progesterone so remember the ring the patch the combined pill these are all estrogen plus progesterone containing contraceptives this is this the patch is changed every week so one every week she has to put a new patch important to remember the patch can be worn anywhere over the body except near the breast okay she should not apply it near the breast because it can increase the incidence of breast cancer okay remember oc pills combined oc pills increase the risk of breast cancer okay what is this we've discussed this is antra okay antra is depo medroxy progesterone acetate okay it is an intramuscular injection given every 3 months this, this is a progesterone only contraceptive till now we were discussing e plus p now these are the progesterone only contraceptives this is an injectable contraceptive the one available by the government of india is called antara okay again possible question what is this this is an implant so again progesterone only implant what is important to remember here this has the best efficacy amongst all the temporary contraceptive methods this has the least failure rate so it is the most effective so if the question comes the most effective contraception is apart from the permanent methods i'm talking about temporary methods 
this is the best or the least failure rate okay next is mirina now mirina is very important okay mirina is very important this is a progesterone containing intrauterine device it contains levonorgestrel okay and what is important to remember is that it was earlier it was the lifespan the lifespan was 5 years which was increased to 7 years and now in 2022 okay the company which manufactures mirina has says has said now it, the life can be in, increased to 8 years so it has to be changed after 8 years this is the new thing that you need to remember not 5 years not 7 years it can be given up till 8 years okay what else do you remember about mirina mirina has a lot of non contraceptive uses okay so what are the non contraceptive uses it can be used in menorrhagia okay any woman who is having heavy excessive bleeding okay and especially in causes which is not distorting the uterine cavity so in large fibroids you can't use but in small fibroids not distorting the cavity you can use it in endometrial hyperplasia you can use it in adenomyosis you can use it and in small fibroids not distorting the cavity you can use it what does it do it causes endometrial atrophy so all the progesterone containing devices they cause two things they cause endometrial atrophy and they increase the cervical mucus thickening okay they make the cervical mucus thick so that sperm can't ascend and they cause atrophy of the endometrium and that is why it reduces bleeding okay now um what else to remember about mirina same um uh, same uh contraindications you can't get pregnant if you have an iucd applies here also so pregnancy okay in any infection uh, uh undiagnosed genital bleeding okay any cancer or malignancy and any distorted cavity you can't use a progesterone containing intrauterine device okay what is this this is chaya so you, you have to remember all these names okay those available by the government of india you have nirodh which is the male condom you have mala n mala d we have antara we have chaya okay so these are the and then you have the of course the copper t380 and the multi load these are all the contraceptives available by the government of india which you need to know what is chaya what does it contain it contains anyone it contains ormeloxifen okay or centchroman okay and this is a selective estrogen receptor modulator okay which causes again an ovulation so it is given initially twice a week for three months and then you shift over to once a week for as long as she wants and the best part is it has no major contraindication so it is very safe in a lot of conditions it has no major contraindications the books will not give any contraindication it can be given in the postpartum period it can be given uh, in women who are elderly who have heart disease who have diabetes in any condition it can be given so no major contraindication chaya has okay again this is a question what are what is lark lark is long acting reversible contraception okay what's the types of long acting reversible contraception what does it mean it basically mean any contraceptive where the frequency of use is more than one month is called a long acting reversible contraception that means you don't have to give something every day or every week the frequency of use is more than one month so what comes under this and it is reversible it is not a permanent method so tubal ligations vasectomy won't come under this so we have injections so dmpa will come under this okay all the intrauterine devices will come under this and the implants will come under. so remember the three things which come a very easy question you should not go wrong here it comes almost every alternate year they ask this question okay so injections intrauterine devices and implants come under long acting reversible or larks okay so this is a question all of the following methods are contraceptive methods which can be used post coitus now post coitus means this is a 2020 question i think post coital means an emergency contraception okay emergency contraception means after an act of unwanted intercourse she now comes for contraception so what can you give we can give this this is called the use phase 
method that is combined high dose combined oral contraceptive pills we can give mifepristone not very commonly given but yes it can be given we can give put in an intrauterine device okay and this is especially for those who want long term contraceptive then we should we can't give danazol danazol is not used for emergency contraception so quickly what is use pace regime it is combined oc pills okay how much do we give we give 100 microgram of ethanol estradiol plus 0.5 milligram of levonorgestrel so we give 50 basically and then after 12 hours we repeat another dose and it can be given up to up to 72 hours of unprotected intercourse the second one is lng this is what is commonly used this is also available by the government of india free available as what is called as the e pill market mein i pill aata hai na agar hospital government hospital jaoge wahan pe e pill ke naam se aata hai emergency pill okay this contains one yes your space is outdated why because it causes a lot of vomiting it's very difficult to take two tablets of oc pills and then repeat after 12 hours so your space is not used this is the preferred method to be used in our country is lng it's also available free by the name e pill okay one single tablet can be given as two tablets also but one tablet is the dose 1.5 mg of levonorgestrel this is the drug of choice outside india ulipristal acetate it's not yet available it's available by the name of ella1 so a single tablet 30 mg up to 5 days aur kahan dete hum ulipristal acetate can anyone tell me which other condition do we give ulipristal acetate in gynecology where else do we give ulipristal acetate anyone i'll wait for the answer so we use it as emergency contraception and the second important use in gyne is which was used quite commonly till a few years back and then it went into disrepute because it was found to cause liver toxicity but now gradually it's come back in the market with an fda warning that lfts have to be checked if you're using this drug yes very good avinash it is used for fibroids okay so fibroids 3 months it can be given in dose of 5 mg per day but it went into disrepute because of the liver toxicity as a side effect so it now it has to be started only if the lfts are normal okay but emergency contraception the drug of choice worldwide or outside india is ulipristal in our country it is lng and intrauterine copper device remember this one both these can be given up till 120 hours of an act of unprotected intercourse and this is preferred in those women who want a continued method okay so she is like she comes to you and says you know put something which i don't have to bother about anymore so give her an intrauterine contraceptive device i'm telling you this because the clue in the question will be this a married lady and has had several mtps now says give me something which will take care of as an emergency plus give long lasting effect act as a lark then put in a copper t okay identify the use of the instrument given below it's a little blurred okay <clears throat> but can you um, sorry can you see what this is this is what is this okay what is this anyone this is what is called a laparoscopic okay or a also called a laparoscopic ring applicator okay look at the ends can you see the ends the ends are like this it's like a grasping hook okay it's like this like a claw so what does this claw do and there is if you look carefully there's a white fallopian ring on the end so it, it grasps the fallopian tube and puts the fallopian ring over it and so it is used for tubal ligation okay this is a short video okay which which is showing you how tubal ligation is done i'm showing you this because it can come as an image okay so that you can see that's the instrument the laparoscopic ring applicator that is the fallop ring being applied this video was given to me by a good friend of mine okay so this is another the other tube also being ligated okay you can follow her on instagram the good gaini okay so she, this is how the fallop ring looks like okay so this is um uh, again an image based question this can come as an image based question laparoscopic ring applicator ek bar pooch chuke hain this question they can ask what are these these are fallop rings okay they are white elastic rings which are put on top of the fallopian tubes okay 
Next question. A woman with a history of infertility is on treatment with HMG. Okay, she presented with the following findings in the ultrasound. What is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, so what is this? This is yes, very good. So this is the, these are the ovaries. Okay, and you can see the follicles, they're huge, huge follicles, which is classically seen in something called as ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And what is HMG? HMG is a gonadotropin, human menopausal gonadotropin. It is given to cause controlled ovarian hyperstimulation in IVF cycles. Okay, so what a little bit about OHSS. Remember that it is seen whenever you get a question, it will be the woman who would have some sort of treatment for IVF she would be on controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. That means history of gonadotropin intake will be there. Okay. And what are the risk factors? Remember, and these are important because they are all clues in your clinical question. Okay. It may be a very straightforward question, but remember it is common in younger women. Those who have polycystic ovarian syndrome, okay, and those with low BMI. So PCOS, usually we see high BMI, but this is common in lean PCOS. Those thin girls who have PCOS, it is common. If she's had a previous history, obviously, if she has high AMH, what is AMH? It is a test of ovarian reserve. So if the AMH is very high, okay, those girls, that means there are more number of follicles in the ovaries, so they have a higher risk of OHSS. Or if on the day of HCG, when we give the trigger of, that is on the day of giving HCG for ovulation, for rupture of the follicles, if they are more than 14 follicles, then again, it's a risk factor for OHSS. Or if she has high, very high estradiol levels. So whenever we're doing IVF, we always keep, every day we do scans to see the size of the follicles, the number of the follicles. We do almost daily estrogen levels. And if they're going very high, we have to, then prevent OHSS. So these are the risk factors. If they are there, we have to take preventive steps. This can come as a question. What can you do? You can avoid HCG as the trigger. So trigger basically means uh, not to cause ovulation. My mistake, I said this earlier, it is to cause maturation of the follicle. Okay, and after giving the trigger, we do what is called as an oocyte aspiration, okay, in an IVF cycle. So don't give HCG because HCG is known to increase the OHSS, the stimulation, okay. So avoid HCG. Instead, you can give a GnRH agonist as the trigger, which will mimic the work of HCG, okay. Prefer antagonist cycles. If she is high risk, don't give agonist. In fact, most days, article we give antagonist cycles only. So give an antagonist cycle. Okay, delay the HCG. So either don't give the HCG or delay the HCG. This is called as coasting. The only definitive way, if a question comes, what is the definitive way to prevent OHSS is to not to go ahead with that IVF cycle, to cancel the cycle. As soon as you see estrogen levels are arising, Many, many follicles are seen on the scan. Then the, the question asks, what is the definitive way to prevent OHSS? The answer should be cancel the cycle. Don't go ahead. Okay. Or you can take, do the oocyte aspiration and don't do an embryo transfer. Preserve the embryos. Okay. Or aspirate the oocytes earlier before they are mature and do in vitro. That means in the lab, let them mature. Okay. So take them out earlier. Very important, this has come as a question. IV albumin is a drug of choice for both prevention and treatment of OHSS, okay? And again, avoid HCG. So basically avoid any form of HCG. That is what you should remember. The only definitive way of preventing this is to cancel the cycle, okay? And IV albumin is the drug of choice, okay? So very, very important. Okay, we'll share the soft copy, Aditya, of the PDF of this, okay? So I won't go into too much detail, but they could be mild and moderate forms which are managed on the outpatient basis of OHSS. Severe and critical need to be admitted and fluid management, IV albumin, anticoagulation because they are at risk of going into DIC, all these need to be given. Okay, let's go back to our questions. This was last year need PG. 59-year-old woman presents with anogenital warts. Genotyping of the virus was done and it showed her to be at risk of atypia 
or squamous cell carcinoma? What is the likely genotype? Answer. So she has warts, okay? But the genotype, so warts is common with HPV type 6 and 11, okay? But the genotyping showed her had to be at risk for atypia or squamous cell carcinoma. So the answer should be HPV 18. Remember the high, highest risk is with HPV 16, okay? Slightly, again, high risk, but less than 16 is HPV 18. So remember 16, 18, 31, 33, 48, 52. These are all the high risk HPV types, okay? A bit about, uh, this is again a very important high yield area, okay, because HPV vaccine is one question and HPV cervical cancer screening, all these are very commonly asked, okay. So high risk types, I told you are 16, 18, 31, 33, if you can remember all these well and good, but remember at least 16, 18, 31, 33, okay, and remember 6 and 11 are the ones which cause the warts, okay. A bit about HPV vaccine because this comes as a question. It is mainly for prevention of CIN and carcinoma cervix, but it also prevents against five other cancers. What are they? Cancer vulva, cancer vagina, cancer of the anal canal, penile cancer, and oropharyngeal cancer, and as we said, genital warts. Okay, so six cancers in all, CA cervix, vulva, vagina. So all the genital, the, the outer genital malignancies, vulva, vagina, and cervix. Then the anal canal, the penis, the oropharynx, and the genital warts. Okay, this has come as a question. It contains recombinant virus-like protein, L1 synthetic capsid protein. Okay, and this has also come as a question. So it's very, very important. So <clears throat> initially we had the cervix. We still have it. Okay, this is a bivalent vaccine. How do you remember which is bivalent, which is quadrivalent? You remember C comes earlier in the alphabet compared to G. That's how I remember. So it is a bivalent, it contains two. Okay, if it comes later in the alphabet, G comes later, it is quadrivalent, okay? So cervix is bivalent, it contains the main two types, okay, that is 16 and 18. Quadric, yeah, so all of them can cause warts. Remember, all of them can cause warts, but more or six and 11 are the low risk types. They mainly cause warts, the other all cause uh, the malignancies, okay? Gardasil is quadrivalent. Remember 6, 11, 16, and 18. Okay. And now Gardasil 9 has come. Okay. Which is nonavalent. That means nine types it covers. Which all uh, these ones I told you, I told you, remember also 31, 33. Remember 45, 52, and 58. This has come as a question. Okay. Now, what does what do our guidelines say? Our guidelines say HPV vaccine has to be given to all girls after the age of nine years. If she is less than 14, then two doses. If she is more than 15, then three doses have to be given. Okay. Upper age is the ideal age is nine to 26, but it can also be given to for women who are less than 45 years, explaining to them that the efficacy might be less because they may have already been exposed to the virus. Okay. Two important things in this topic. Remember, this has come as a question in INI. That's why I put it. Okay. So the SAGE group, okay, of WHO, okay, they recommended that ek bhi vaccine, ek bhi dose chala jai, it's enough. Okay, at least something they are getting, some protection they're getting. So they said if she is less than 20 years, group these together. If she is less than 20 years, one or two also is sufficient. And if she is more than 20, more than 21, sorry, if she is more than 21, then two doses should be given. So, pehle kya tha? Abhi kya? Abhi bhi kya hai? India, mare guidelines mein kya? Less than 15 years, two doses. And above that, we give three doses. But what WHO says, less than 20 years, one or two doses also is enough. And more than 21 years, two doses. Okay. And very important, new Somebody has written here, very good, Servavac. Okay, it's going to be launched in India on 1st June. Okay, and it's going to be very, very, it's a very, very important development because of the cost. Okay, Gardasil costs 6,000 rupees per dose. Okay, this is going to cost around 400 rupees per dose. Okay, it's going to be available easily to the masses. And that is very important. That's why it's such an important development. I'm sure a question is going to come on this in this year's exam. Okay. So, Servavac, it is a, remember, it is a quadrivalent vaccine like Gardasil, okay, against 6, 11, 16, and 18. 
Okay, so remember, Servavac is our indigenous vaccine. <laughs> okay, some two questions from Eurogyne, which came. This was not a very nice question, okay? Because his answer was in one place, he was very, very angry. finally, Gaini got to get it. Okay, so what is the question? You are asked to prepare the discharge summary of a patient who has had a repair for VVF. For how long will you ask her to abstain from sexual intercourse and delay contraception? By? So my husband is a urologist and he told me that he has taken it from a specific book. Ke se because it's it's a very vaguely asked question. And then you open Tata, it's nicely the same word to word, it's been picked up from there. Okay. So the answer is you will advise after a VVF repair, three months abstinence and to delay conception by one year. So just remember this. Okay, there's not much to it. Just remember three months abstinence. I put it here because it's come as a question, but it's not a very nice question. And delay conception by one year. Next question. Okay, this has come several times in the past. Okay, 55 year old lady with five children presents with leakage of urine on coughing. On examination, there is a second degree prolapse and a cystocele. What is the most likely urinary abnormality? So, this is very obvious. She is coughing. So, this is leakage on cough is stress incontinence. Okay. For CPT, for chronic perineal tear repair, Avinash, both places three months, yes. For CPT, also three months, you will advise, okay. For delayed repair, yes. You will not do if the woman has come with a chronic perineal tear after delivery. She comes to you, say, two weeks after delivery. You will not repair. You will repair it after three months. That's what someone is asking on the group, okay. So, stress incontinence is um, uh, what is there because on stress, she's having incontinence, Okay. Let's see the other questions. Uh, a gravida 3 P2L2 presents at seven weeks for termination of pregnancy by medical methods. As per comprehensive abortion care guidelines, the following drugs are used. So I think we all know this. Remember, first trimester MTP. We give mefiprostone plus mesoprostol. This is very straightforward. It's very easy. Let me just tell you though. Or let, let us revise this. So mefiprostone. Okay, we give 200 milligram, okay, orally and followed by 48 hours later by mesoprostol. Okay, we give 800 microgram, although the uh, some guidelines say you can even give, if she's less than seven weeks, you can give 400. If she's seven to nine weeks, you can give 800. Okay, so this can be given vaginally, it can also be given orally, it can be given sublingually it can be given buccally it can be given rectally so mesoprostol can be given it's a tablet can be given in many forms commonly we give it vaginally or orally okay now important to remember till when can you give medical mtp in the first trimester till nine weeks okay seven weeks se pehle do to the, if the effectivity is very good failure rate is less seven to nine weeks the failure rate goes slightly less 9 to 12 weeks, we prefer not to give, but the WHO says you can still give till 12 weeks. Okay, but we prefer the government of India guidelines say 9 weeks, WHO says you can give till 12 weeks also. Okay, now this is the first trimester. What, in the, what about the second trimester? Second trimester also the same combination. We give MIFI plus meso, but meso has to be given in a higher dose and more frequently. There's no fixed combination. It is usually given as 400 microgram every four to six hourly till she has, till she expels the fetus. Okay, so there's no fixed dose. First trimester is very fixed, 200 milligram mifepristone orally, followed by 48 hours later by mesoprostol. What is mesoprostol? It is prostaglandin E1. And what is mifepristone? It is RU486. It is an anti-progesteron. So when you give mifepristone, you're basically you're cutting off the support to the pregnancy. And then you're giving <clears throat> mesoprostol, which is causing uterine contractions and cervical dilatation. Now, this is new. Okay, this is last year guidelines by the WHO. As I said, you can it says you can give mifi plus meso till 12 weeks. It has now given a new regime. Okay, so very, very important. It is a potential question. Maybe, I don't know if this needs PG, but definitely in future exams, yes. 
WHO guideline and very important for INI. Okay, combination regime. They have said you can now give letrozole also. Okay, so letrozole plus mesoprostol is the new combination given by the WHO in 2022. Please remember this. Okay, letrozole or kahan dete hum? Where else do we give letrozole? We give letrozole in. It is the drug of choice in ovulation induction in women who have PCOD. Very good. Okay, so it is a drug of choice in ovulation induction in women who have PCOS. But remember, letrozole, ab isme bhi aagaya. Kaise dete hai? 10 milligram orally for 3 days, followed by mesoprosol 800 microgram sublingually on the 4th day is what is now being said by the WHO for first trimester abortions. Okay. Let's move on. 28-year-old woman with infertility presents to you on ultrasound. There is an intramural fibroid measuring 7 by 5 centimeter near the right cornua and another fibroid measuring this much near the left cornua. HSG reveals a bilateral tubal block at the region of the tubal ostea. Semen parameters are normal and there is no ovulatory disturbance. What is the best management for this woman? What will you do? Okay, somebody is asking letrozole management mechanism of action. Letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor. Okay, so it inhibits the action of, so it basically prevents estrogen from being formed. Okay, so it's an aromatase inhibitor. Yes, the correct answer is you will do a myomectomy here. Okay, now remember when you have fibroids plus infertility. Okay. Now, when should you do a myomectomy? This a concept is very important to understand. Indications for myomectomy in infertility. So if a girl comes to you, a woman comes to you infertile and everything else being normal, no, it's, it's mentioned here also, no ovulatory disturbance, semen analysis normal, okay? What should you, when should you remove them? So remember, all submucosal fibroids need to be removed, okay? And if they are type 0 or type 1, how will you remove them? By a hysteroscope. You will do a hysteroscopic myomectomy. That means, what is a submucosal fibroid? This is the uterus. This is a submucosal fibroid within the endometrial cavity. Okay. This lady had intramural. Intramural means inside the myometrium. Okay. So any intramural fibroid more than 5 centimeters or distorting the cavity. It's so big, it's distorting the cavity and thereby may be hampering implantation. Okay. So anything more than 5 centimeter in an infertile woman needs to be removed or if they're causing tubal block as is given in this question. Okay. But this question otherwise also fulfills the other criteria because they are more than 5 centimeters, okay? And subserous fibroids need not be removed unless they are very, very large in size and they may hamper the outcome of pregnancy. So remember, all submucosal fibroids and intramural fibroids, remember these two, distorting the cavity and large intramural fibroids more than 5 centimeters. Okay, so this is important to understand. Okay, next question. 60-year-old woman with postmenopausal bleeding, ultrasound reveals a mass with a feeding vessel as shown. What is the most likely diagnosis? What is this? This is the vessel. This is a TVS, transvaginal scan. Okay, this is the uterus and this is the endometrium. You can see a large space occupying lesion with a feeding vessel. This is a endometrial polyp. Okay, remember this is an endometrial polyp. How do we know what is the main feature? Is this vessel? It will have a single feeding vessel. Okay, and remember this has come with postmenopausal bleeding. This is not endometrial carcinoma. Endometrial carcinoma will be very irregular. Okay, it will be invading into the myometrium. Okay, leomyosarcoma, unlikely it's a fibroid polyp because they will have circumferential vascularity, vascularity all around, not a single feeding vessel. Single feeding vessel is the clue here. This is an endometrial polyp. Okay. Next question. A patient had to undergo hysteroscopic polypectomy by bipolar electrocautery. So what is the ideal agent for distension? This is, I think, a 2020 NEPG question. Anyone? So here the clue is bipolar. So whenever you're, you're using bipolar cautery, okay, you can use an electrolyte solution. So you can use normal cell line. Okay. Whenever you're using monopolar cautery, you have to use an electrolyte free solution. So here you will use glycine 
or mannitol or dextrose. Okay, so remember whenever we do a hysteroscopy, okay, we always distend, the uterus is compressed. We have to open up the walls of the uterus to see inside. So that is opened up by fluid distension media. Carbon dioxide very rarely is used. It is hardly, I have never seen it being used. The books do say it can be used, but we know for all practical purposes, we use fluid media. Fluid media, we have two choices, electrolyte one, normal saline, which is used for all diagnostic hysteroscopes or when you're using a bipolar instrument. Okay, when you're using a monopolar, you have to use an electrolyte free fluid so that the current is not passed on and cause burns. Okay, so for a monopolar, remember, you have to use glycine or mannitol or dextrose. But for um, uh, bipolar, it has to be normal saline. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Next question. This is, a, this is a small video of a hysteroscopy just to show you because you can get images on this. And let me just fast forward. Okay. This one is better because here you're seeing inside the cavity. So you can see that's fluid inside. Okay. And once the fluid, you can see the bit of debris floating around. Okay, once you're inside, you can see the cavity very clearly. You can see those air bubbles also. That's the fundus. Okay, and if we move the scope, you can see one ostia on one side. That's an ostia. Okay, and you can see the other ostia on the other side. Okay, so that's how a hysteroscopic image looks like. There is fluid inside. In laparoscopy, what do we put inside? We instill gas inside we instill carbon dioxide okay so that's important to understand the basic difference in a hysteroscopy is we distend with fluid in a laparoscopy we distend with gas okay this is another picture of a hysteroscopy and i think here okay this is showing a hystero tell me what this is what are we doing here what is that you can see inside anyone Okay, so what am I taking out? I did, could, could anybody identify the intrauterine device? This is not adhesiolysis. This is me taking out a intrauterine device. This is not a marina. Did you see it was nicely serrated? It was like, see, what is this? It was a multi-load, okay? So this is a missing multi-load inside, okay? This was an intrauterine device. Again, a hysteroscope can be used to remove a missing intrauterine device. Okay, next question. A 25-year-old woman who is anxious to conceive comes to the OPD with complaints of profuse wide discharge for two days. There is no itching. Her cycles are regular. What is the most likely diagnosis? What do you think this is? Is it trichomoniasis? Is it physiological? Is it BV or is it candidiasis? Okay. Okay, okay. So again, a little bit confusion here. The answer is it is physiological. Okay, it is normal discharge. Why are we saying it is normal? Because even though it is profuse and even though she is anxious to conceive, not, no other history is given. Her symptoms are only for two days. Okay, and no vaginitis causes infertility, although BV has been implicated, but it is not proven. It is more or less implicated in recurrent pregnancy loss and abortions. Okay, not really in infertility. But remember, these three infections are very common. Okay, which three? We have bacterial vaginosis, we have trichomoniasis, we have candidiasis, and you should know what they are. Okay. What is bacterial vaginosis? Remember this and the remember what you remember. Remember the type of discharge. It is white, thin, homogeneous, and it is foul smelling, but there will be no pruritus. Okay. No pruritus in BV. Okay. The type of discharge is grayish, white, thin, homogeneous. Okay. It occurs in a pH of more than 4.5. Remember, candida is the one which happens in an acidic pH. The rest are more in an alkaline sort of pH. Okay, on examination, you won't find any erythema. The vagina and cervix will look fine. What is the diagnosis? Diagnosis is by AMSEL criteria. What are the criteria for AMSEL criteria? Very good. One is clue cells. One is the type of discharge that is white, thin, homogeneous discharge. What else? 
The third is whiff test. That is on adding KOH, you have this sudden smell of ammonia. And the fourth is the pH, okay? So <clears throat> the pH is more than 4.5, okay? So three out of these four is called as AMSELS criteria to diagnose bacterial vaginosis. I will just show you a picture of blue cells because that commonly comes. Okay, second is trichomoniasis. Okay. So trichomoniasis is caused by a flagellated protozoan, okay? Trichomoniasis vaginalis. And it presents with a yellowish, so greenish, yellowish. If the clue is there in the question, it is trichomoniasis. Remember, there'll be a lot of pruritus. They will be associated with urinary symptoms. Strawberry vagina is commonly seen. Strawberry vagina and strawberry cervix. Again, pH is high. And when you do a wet mount of the secretions, you will see the flagellated organism. In both of these, what do you give? You give metronidazole or secnidazole. Okay, to treat this. What about candidiasis? Here you'll have thick curdy discharge. They will be pruritus and dysuria. They will be erythema also, but the SPH will be acidic in candidiasis. Okay, and what will you see on the microscope? You will see pseudohyphae or spores. Okay, treatment is with clotrimazole. Okay, now very important to remember to see, know are these, these images. What is this? This is, what is this? This is a clue cell. Okay, so normally when you see the vaginal epithelial cell, they will be very nicely seen, as in the borders will be nicely seen. But what are clue cells? Here you will have the bacilli, the gardenella vaginalis and other bacilli. They will coat the surface of the epithelial cell and make it look very blurry at the edges. Okay, and these are called as clue cells. So this is a very important question. It's come several times. What is this? This is your organism, the flagellated trichomoniasis vaginalis. Okay, it has the flagella. Can you see these flagella? So this can also come as an image-based question. What is this? If this is your smear, what is this? These are pseudohyphae. Okay, these are not clue cells. Don't get confused. Look at the image properly. This is candidiasis. Okay, so this is these three discharges are very, very important. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. Avinash, you're asking how to differentiate between physiological and BV. BV will have profuse discharge, okay, and she'll have a foul odor, okay? The smell will be there, okay? That's why the whiff test also is positive, okay? And she may have, they may give you a history saying she has, she had a history of an abortion or she's had a history of recurrent losses. That would be the clue in bacterial vaginosis, okay? Physiological, they'll give you a clue that it has very short duration or it is more of premenstrual or ovulatory. So they'd give you some sort of clue for that. Okay. Now, okay. So this is another thing which I thought I'd put here. Okay. Syndromic management. So NACO, what NACO has given is in the primary health centers, they've given different kits, even in all government hospitals actually. And they have explained to the nurses there that syndromic management needs to be done of sexually transmitted infections, okay? And each kit has a color, okay? And each kit has different drugs, okay? And to be given for different things. So what should we give for what is the question that is very important to understand, okay? So anyone knows the answer here? Okay, the, the answer is, kit one will be given for urethral discharge. Kit 2 will be given for vaginal discharge. Kit 3 will be given for genital ulcer. Kit 6 will be given for PID. <clears throat> now, it's not very easy to remember, okay? But I will try to make you understand and find a way to remember this, okay? So, try to uh, uh, be with me and let's try to understand this or make mnemonics to make this easier to understand. Some of you might have seen my uh, video on YouTube where I put the mnemonics there. You can go back and check that out also. But it's actually quite easy to remember. So kit one, remember, is gray in color. Okay, it is for cervical or urethral discharge. Okay, and it contains azithromycin and cefixim. It is gray in color. How do we remember this? Remember that? Remember that? Cervical or wait, sorry. Remember, gray discharge is treated with cervical 
antibiotics. I'm just telling you some quick mnemonics to remember. Okay, so gray discharge, gray for the color gray is first treated. Remember first treated, one for first for the kit number one with cervical antibiotics. C for cervical discharge, C also for the drug cefixim and antibiotics A for azithromycin. So gray discharge is first treated with cervical antibiotics is the mnemonic for kit one. Remember it is given for cervical or urethral discharge. It is gray in color, contains cefixim, azithromycin. Second is vaginal discharge, the kit, green kit. If you have OPD, the green kit we give very, very commonly. Okay, now green kit, remember we've just discussed vaginitis. It covers both the causes. It covers all three causes. Second is all will take care of metron of BV and trico and pluconazole will take care of candidiasis. Okay, how do you remember this? Remember this by two green fields she vows okay that's how i remember this two for two green for the color green okay fields f for fluconazole s for secundazole and vows v for vaginitis two green fields she vows okay so some of you have your own mnemonics those of you who have your own mnemonics don't get confused by mine okay i'm telling you this for those who don't have the mnemonics okay because this is something which is not easy to remember mujhe bhi sirf kit 2 or kit 6 yaad rehta hai because ye hum commonly opd mein dete hain hamara baki nahi aa rahi samjho ask me over the top of my head i won't remember so this is one way to make it easy to remember okay next remember kit 3 and kit 4 are given for the same reason for genetic ulcer genital ulcer which is non herpetic okay and kit 4 hum tab dete hain agar benzathine se if the girl or woman has allergy then we give then we give uh, uh, kit four. So otherwise, it's the same thing. Okay. So how do you remember this? Remember three white girls are broke. Okay. How do you remember this? Kit three, three white girls are broke. What is three? Three for kit three. White, white for the color. Girls, G-U. Girls with the spelling of G-U. So genital ulcer, non-herpetic. R broke, A for azithromycin, B for benzathine penicillin. So three white girls are broke. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So I think some of you are posting your own mnemonics. Let's go to the next one. Next is, is also remember, remember fourth girl. Okay. Fourth girl. So four for... um um. Uh, kit 4, GU for genital ulcer. Okay. Uh, so you see, even I'm <laughs> forgetting the mnemonic, but let me try to remember. Fourth girl, it was something does, wait, something with A, D, and A, and blue. Okay. I've also forgotten the mnemonic. You can go and check my YouTube video for it. So for fourth girl, you can find a mnemonic DNA. So basically, doxy and azithro come in kit four and blue okay so fourth girl remember three and four both are for genital ulcer that's important and they are white and blue okay fifth is red and how do you remember this this one i remember fifth girl has red accents okay so fifth for kit five gu for genital ulcer h for herpetic a for as a cyclovir because it is herpetic and red for the color red. So fifth girl has red accents. Okay. Okay. Somebody is asking, ma'am, they're useful for both male and female. And we're, so this is basically syndromic management. They could either be for either partner. It doesn't have to be male or female. Okay. They could be for either partner. Usually kit six is for the female partner because it is for PID. The rest can be for any male or female because they are treatment of sexually transmitted infections. Okay. Now, kit six, remember, is the yellow kit. And this is the one we give for PID or if she comes with lower abdominal pain, that is the main symptom. Okay. This contains three drugs. It contains cefixim, okay, a single tablet plus metro and doxy for two weeks. Okay. That is the treatment protocol for PID, metronidazole plus doxycycline for two, for, for two weeks or 14 days. Okay, so remember this by six yellow doors make cats playful. Okay, so six for the kit six, yellow for the color, D for doxy, M for metro, C for suffixim, and playful, P for pain or P for PID. Okay, and the last one, 
is the black kit. This is not kit six, this is kit seven. Correct that mistake, it's kit seven. This is for inguinal bubo and it contains doxy plus azithro. How do you remember this? Seven black bags are dropped. Okay, so seven for kit seven, black for the color black, B for bubo, inguinal bubo, azithral and azithro and doxy. So remember kit four and kit seven are the same as azithro and doxy, just the duration is different. Kit seven has doxy for three weeks. Okay, so you all have your mnemonics. Nahi samajh aara, YouTube pe five minutes ka video hai. You can go and have a look there. Okay, but these are important. These come as questions and they are very, very important to understand. Okay, next question. A 39-year-old woman presents to the medicine OPD with complaints of fatigue and lethargy. She gives a history of delivering a 3.5 kg baby five years earlier following which she has received multiple blood transfusions. Okay. She never resumed menstruation following delivery and also had failure of lactation. So this question comes very, very commonly. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Oi, Kawa. Fourth girl dresses as blue. That was the mnemonic. Thank you so much. I was thinking Which is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, so this is... A, so whenever you have history of PPH or history of multiple blood transfusions following followed by either failure of lactation or secondary amenorrhea or feeling or symptoms of hypothyroidism, then it is always Sheehan syndrome, okay? So Sheehan syndrome will present as secondary amenorrhea in, 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 in a gynae OPD. She will present with secondary amenorrhea and failure of lactation, okay? So what happens? It is pituitary apoplexy. There is pituitary necrosis because of less blood supply to the pituitary when there is postpartum hemorrhage. So Sheehan syndrome, dono papers mein aaya. Neat PG 2021 mein bhi aaya or fit 2022 mein bhi aaya, okay? So again, a very important area. So women with the history of PPH and lactational failure, she presents complaints of amenorrhea after one year. The possible diagnosis is she has. So you can see these are, these are I put this here because Katina repeats, Aate repeats definitely come. So many repeats come and you should not go wrong in these simple, simple questions. Okay. <clears throat> Next question. This is another favorite question. 12-year-old girl is brought to the OPD by her mother. She is concerned that she is shorter than her peers. On examination, there is ptosis, shield-like chest, and a webbed neck. On evaluation, which of the following would you expect to find? What will you expect to find? So what is this? Webbed neck, shield-like test, chest, typical of Turner syndrome or 45XO. What will you find? You will find streak ovaries and an infantile uterus because there is no estrogen. So ultrasound will show streak ovaries, okay? These are the features of Turner syndrome. I won't go into too much detail. We will come to this in primary amenorrhea, which I want to discuss next, okay? Next question. A female patient presents with a complete perineal tear two weeks after a home delivery. When should the tear be repaired? We've just discussed this. Ideal repair. It can be done earlier also, but remember most of the standard books say it has to be repaired at three months postpartum, okay? In fact, some books say after eight weeks. That, that So for that, the closest answer would be three months, okay? So the tear should be repaired at three months, okay? Not six weeks, three months. CPT repair, repair at three months, okay? Next question. So what are the types of obstetric repairs? Let's just quickly see this. We have a first degree repair. We have a second degree repair. We have a third degree repair. And we have a fourth degree repair. Okay. Uh, sorry. A fourth degree tear. First degree tear kya hota hai? First, first degree tear hota hai when there is either the mucosa or the skin has been involved. And these are commonly obstetric injuries. Okay. And this can come as an image or this can come as a, uh, a question that the mucosa has given way. What is the what is the type? So first degree is only mucosa or only skin. Second degree is when there's mucosa, muscle and skin. So the question can come and episiotomy is a type of which degree tear? So an episiotomy is a type of a second degree tear where the mucosa goes. You can this is the mucosa, the muscle goes and the skin also goes. Third degree tear is when the anal sphincter gets involved, okay? So we have, de depending on the type, we have 3A, we have 3B and 3C. 
Three A is when less than 50% of the external sphincter gives way. Three B is when more than 50% of the external sphincter gives way. And three C is when the internal anal sphincter also gets involved. Four is when the anal mucosa is involved. Okay, so fourth degree tear is when the anal mucosa also involves. Okay. So someone has asked why the tear occurs after two weeks. The tear doesn't occur after two weeks. The tear occurs then, but it, most of the time it's a home delivery or it has gone unnoticed. And after two weeks, the patient realizes that she's passing stool or there is no, there is a communication between the rectum and the vagina. And that is when they present. Many times it happens, deliveries at home, especially when they come to us or die handle deliver deliveries, they come to us much later, one, two, three weeks. And then we don't repair them immediately. We wait at least after eight weeks the closest answer there is three months. Okay. Now, very, very important. So I want all of you to pay attention here because it's a very important topic. It's a very, it's an area where a lot of questions can come and have come. So I've put together just the brief of how you will evaluate your patient. And then we've have, we have some nine, 10 questions on primary amenorrhea. Okay. First of all, definition. In the absence of secondary sexual characters, the age is taken as 13 years. And in the presence, it is taken as 15 years. That means a girl who comes to us, okay, and say she is 13 years old and she has no secondary sexual characters, we will define her as primary amenorrhea because you expect that by that age, at least estrogen would have started its function and some characters will be there. So the absence of secondary sexual characters basically means there is no exposure to estrogen. There is no exposure to estrogen. And that is why we take this cutoff as 13 years. But in the presence, so once she started developing secondary sexual characters, we can wait till 15 years. Now, some books give 14 years and 16 years. Okay. But the new Novax gives 13 and 15. It's also explained why the cutoff has been taken one year less because menarche as such has started occurring earlier. Okay. So early, earlier definition was 14 and 16. Now it says 13 and 15. There is a slight difference in some books, but if you go by Novax and if you go by Nelson, both give 13 and 15 as the answer, as the definition of primary amenorrhea. <laughs> now, what happens? Let's just understand a bit of basics. There are some topics in OBS and Gynae where you need to understand the concepts. You can't mug up. Okay. One is like, for example, RH isomerization. Similarly, primary amenorrhea is where we will spend some 10 minutes discussing this so that you understand this better and you're able to solve the questions. So to have a period, a girl should have a normal hypothalamus, a normal pituitary, a normal ovary, and a normal uterus and also a normal outflow tract. Everything should be normal for her to get her period right. So if there's a problem in the outflow tract or in the uterus, it is called a compartment one defect. If there's a problem in the ovary, it's called a compartment two defect. If there's a problem in the pituitary, it's called a compartment three defect. And if there's a problem in compartment four, it's called a it's called a compartment four. Okay, somebody is asking, can you discuss the types of abortion at the end? Yes, at the end, just remind me, we'll discuss the types of abortion. Okay, so this is the types of compartment defects. Okay, now if we talk about compartment one defects, kya thai about, about compartment one, that means outflow or uterine problems. Here we will, we will come, MRKH, which we've already discussed. We've discussed imperfect hymen, we've discussed transverse anal septum. And just... For sake of completion, I have put this also here, androgen insensitivity syndrome, which we will discuss in more detail. But remember, I just put it here because it doesn't have a uterus. That's why I put it under compartment one syndrome. Okay. Compartment two may kya aega? Sara ovary wala problem aega. Wherever the ovary is problematic, that means dysgenetic gonads. That means dysgenetic means gonads which have not formed properly, like Turner syndrome, like pure dysgenesis, which is 46XX, or swire, which is 46XY. Ab is me bhot confusion hota hai. 46XY kis me hota hai, XX kis me hota hai. Easy way to remember jaha pe Y hai, wo XY hai. How do we remember this? Swire has a Y. So it is 46XY. Or kahan pe aapko Y dikh raha hai? Androgen insensitivity. So this is also 46XY. There are only two conditions of primary amenorrhea which cause, which are 46XY, which you should know. One is swire and one is androgen insensitivity. Easy to remember. Jahan Y hai, wo Y hai. Wo 46XY hai. Theke? 
Then compartment three is your pituitary problems. Okay, this could be a neoplasia, hyperprolactinemia, empty cella. So any pro prolactin tumor or any problem there will cause compartment three. And compartment four, remember Kalman's, very important. So anosmia plus primary amenorrhea. Here you'll have anosmia. Okay, so these are the basic symptoms, which is basic uh, 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 diagnosis when you have primary amenorrhea. These are the possible conditions that you are dealing with okay now let's discuss three of the important ones and then move on to how will you evaluate your patient mrkh remember it is the second most common cause what is the most common cause of primary amenorrhea anyone what is the most common cause the most common cause is The most common cause of primary amenorrhea is 45XO, that is Turner syndrome. Remember that. And the second most common cause is Mullerian agenesis. We already read about this. It She has ovaries. She has 46XX. The only problem is that the uterus hasn't formed. Okay. So the external genitalia is female, but the vagina, only the lower one third has formed. That's why it is a small blind vagina. The uterus is there, the cervix is there, the, sorry, the uterus is absent, the cervix is absent, absent, the fallopian tube is absent and the upper vagina is absent. Okay, but the ovaries are normal and that is why she has secondary sexual characters. Now, what will happen to FSHLH? Will they be, what will happen to FSHLH will be normal and estrogen levels will also be normal. So, everything will be normal. The only problem is that the uterus is not there and that is why she has amenorrhea. She many of them will have renal and skeletal abnormalities, and we've discussed management to give her sexual functional function. You'll do a vaginoplasty to increase the length of the vagina, and for fertility, you will give her a surrogate because the ovaries are normal. Okay, or the newer thing now is the uterine transplant. Okay, so that is important. Okay, so we've discussed this. Okay, next important one, we've discussed this. I won't discuss going to imperfect hymen. Okay, so she'll present with cryptomenorrhea, bluish bulge is seen, cruciate incision is given. Okay, now this is very important. Okay, very, very important. Androgen insensitivity syndrome. Remember, it is an X-linked recessive disorder where there's an abnormality in the androgen receptor. So testosterone is there. But because there is a problem in the receptor, the testosterone is not able to act. So the karyotype is 46XY. They are male karyotype, but female phenotype because the testosterone is not able to act and the external genitalia is that of a female. Secondary sexual characters, are they present or are they absent? Remember, they are present, okay, because testosterone is getting converted to estrogen and the breast development is there okay so if you have a question saying breasts are well developed but pubic and axillary hair are sparse then think of androgen insensitivity syndrome so breast is developed so overall we say secondary sexual characters usually are present okay fsh if you see the levels fsh is moderately raised testosterone is normal and how do you manage can you give them sexual function yes you can do a vaginoplasty can they get pregnant no, they can't get pregnant. Why? So pregnancy is not possible because there are no ovaries and there is no uterus. So they can't get pregnant. Okay, that's very important to understand. They, the only thing you can counsel them is for adoption. But sexual function can be given to them. Okay, and partial androgen insensitivity syndrome is when there is the testosterone is partially acting. So the androgen receptor is partially acting. So these girls will present with clitoromegaly. That means some uh, sort of uh, um, uh, uh, genitalia is a little is female, but they will have some so testosterone. So they will have signs of virilization. And that the common, common thing we discuss when we talk about virilization is clitoromegaly. The clitoris is more than one centimeter is the definition of clitoromegaly. It is a sign of virilization because some testosterone is acting. Okay. Now, when you talk about gonadal dysgenesis, this is basically we will be discussing Turner syndrome. Okay. 
And at the end of this, we will discuss how to manage a patient with primary amenorrhea. That is most important. Okay, so there are streak gonads. Okay, secondary sexual characters are absent. Okay, abhi tak jitte bhi humne pare, usme present the. Whenever the ovary is not functioning, that means there is no estrogen. So estrogen levels will be low. Because of low estrogen levels, it will give a positive feedback. So FSH, LH levels will be high. This is very important to understand. Ovarian dysgenesis, estrogen will be low. FSH, LH levels will be high. Okay. So internal genitalia are of female or male. Somebody is asking, they will be of female. And all of these, these are, we're not discussing disorders of sexual differentiation. We're talking about primary amenorrhea. All these will present as female phenotype except partial AIS, which may present with features of virilization like clitoromegaly. Remember, Turner's is the most common cause of primary amenorrhea. What will you give? You will give her HRT, hormonal replacement therapy. And if it is, sorry, if it is, if it is a swire, one second. If it is, if it you give her hrt but if it is a 46 xy okay that means swire type of gonadal dysgenesis you will also do a gonadectomy okay you will remove the gonads because of the increased risk of malignancy okay kalman syndrome we already discussed this is the hypothalamic cause so anosmia with primary amenorrhea this is your clue it should be kalman syndrome okay they could be associated abnormalities primary amenorrhea is the rule remember this has come as a question before secondary amenorrhea nahi hota hai primary amenorrhea hi hota hai theek hai the ovaries are usually small what happens to fsh lh because the hypothalamus is not functioning fsh lh is low and estrogen levels are low. So this is called as hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Okay. And how will you manage this? Here you will give her gonadotropins. Okay. You will give her FSH, you will give her LH and that will help resume the ovarian function. Okay. Now coming to the flowchart. So when a girl, when the question comes to you, they will give you primary amenorrhea and they will tell you whether secondary sexual characters are present or absent. That's the first thing you need to see. Okay. Now, if she has secondary sexual characters, iska kya matlab hai? Iska matlab hai estrogen is there in the body. Okay. So what should you do next? You should examine her or do a scan and see if there is a uterus. That's the next important thing. Okay. If there is a uterus, okay, if the uterus or if there is, if the uterus is absent, that means what are we thinking of? We're thinking of either two conditions, either MRKH or we are thinking of androgen insensitivity syndrome, a compartment four defect, okay, because ovaries are functioning or gonads are functioning, okay, the only thing which is not there is a uterus. So absent uterus, what will you do next? You will do a karyotype. So the question can come at any level. They can give you just till here and ask next investigation of choice or they can give you till here till the till this imaging is done and uh, uterus is absent now what what is the next investigation then you will ask for a karyotype okay and if it is 46 x x it is mrkh if it is 46 x y it is ais androgen insensitivity syndrome and if the uterus is present what do you think of you will now think of an outflow abnormality that means either imperforate hymen or a transvaginal septum but if everything is all right then you will think of probably a constitutional delay or early pcos or some other cause okay constitutional means and tell her to wait for some time everything looks normal okay so this is how if secondary sexual characters are present what you will do what is the line of management so first thing look for a uterus if uterus is absent then you need to look for the karyotype and then find out what it is. If uterus is present, look for outflow tract obstructions. And if that is there, it could either be imperforate or a TVS. Now, next set of uh, next set of questions. Kaise aa sakta? Primary amenorrhea, breast not developed, absent pubic, axillary hair. So no secondary sexual characters. What will you do? The next thing you will see is the height. Question may clue the hour, short height. So kya ho jayega? think of Turner syndrome. So if she is short in height, what will you do? You will do an FSH. Okay. Your, it more, most likely is Turner's, but still to confirm, do an FSH. Yeah. If the FSH is low, 
दैट मीन्स इट्स अ हाइपोथैलमिक और अ पिटरी कॉज मे बी ग्रोथ हॉर्मोन भी कम है इसलिए उसका हाइट कम है बट इफ एफ एस एच इज हाई ओके देन think of a ovarian problem and it will be turner syndrome if she is also short in height so remember in an ovarian cause the estrogen will be low and reflexly the fsh lh will be high but if it's a hypothalamic pituitary cause cause everything will be low okay so if the height is normal then again we do an fsh and again if it is low think of a again a hypothalamic cause like isolated gnrh deficiency and if it is high think of gonadal dysgenesis either pure or swier syndrome okay so i hope this is clear <coughs> yes swier is 46 xy remember y jahan pe hota hai wo that is 46 xy so remember 46 xy are two swier and androgen in sensitivity because both have y in them an easy way to remember okay now let's do some eight nine questions on this match the correct condition with the karyotype this is last to last year's ini match the correct condition mrkh will be what <coughs> mrkh will be 46 xx swire will be 46 xy turners will be 45 xo and ais will be 46 xy it's very simple okay if you know that y jahan pe hai वो है फोर्टी सिक्स एक्स वाई ओके नेक्स्ट विच इज नॉट अ कॉज ऑफ सेकेंडरी एम दीज आर ऑल क्वेश्चन कम इन द लास्ट थ्री इयर्स ओके दे मे नॉट बी नीट पी जी आई पिक सम फ्रॉम आई एन आई ऑल्सो बिकॉज आई वॉन्ट टू कवर दिस होल टॉपिक ऑफ प्राइमरी एम एन ओरिया विच इज नॉट अ कॉज ऑफ सेकेंडरी एम एन ओरिया एनी वन which is not a cause of secondary amenorrhea yes calmans is always always a cause of primary amenorrhea all these cause secondary turner mosaic hai that means some chromosomes are abnormal not the entire lot fragile x premutation typically causes premature ovarian failure and presents as secondary amenorrhea and she hands we've just discussed causes secondary amenorrhea okay next question 16 year old girl presents with complaints of primary amenorrhea now let's read further she has a female phenotype her height is 150 height means 150 means normal next she has poorly developed breasts what does this mean secondary sexual characters absent that means hum apne second flow chart mein aayenge okay on further evaluation a vagina was present scan reveals a normal uterus but gonads are not seen investigations showed high fsh and karyotype is xy so everything is given okay what is this what is this karyotype is xy so second flow chart pe aao absent secondary sexual characters hain theek hai fsh high hai karyotype 46 xy hai uterus is there gonads are not seen what do you think this is this is swier syndrome and swier is a form of gonadal dysgenesis so the answer is gonadal dysgenesis the ovaries are not formed or are not working pro properly that is why she has no secondary sexual characters that is why her fsh levels are high okay so i hope this is clear so don't get confused in these questions they are very very simple so many clues will be given to you next question 18 year old girl primary amenorrhea she has 45 xo that means turners so what should be done next she has an infantile uterus in turners what do we do we give hormone replacement therapy to induce puberty to grow the size of the uterus okay so hrt should be given she has a vagina this is not required this is not required this is this will be done if it is an xy karyotype not an xo okay next question primary amenorrhea examination has normal breasts and absent axillary hairs okay pelvic examinations show shows a vagina with clitoromegaly okay so primary amenorrhea with signs of virilization always think of androgen insensitivity which kind the complete or the partial kind always think of the partial kind okay so gonads are visible what is the most likely diagnosis it is partial androgen insensitivity syndrome remember in ais also you will do a gonadectomy jahan pe bhi 46 xy hai wahan pe aap gonadectomy karoge hi karoge okay <clears throat> next what are the classical fsh and lh levels in turner syndrome so turners mein streak ovaries 
So estrogen is low and FSH and LH are high. So what is the correct answer? A correct answer should be high FSH and high LH. So I hope you're getting the hang of these questions. These are none of my own questions. These are all questions which have come. Which of the following should be the next investigation in a woman presenting with primary amenorrhea and normal secondary sexual character? So this go back to our first flow chart. Primary amenorrhea, present secondary sexual characters. What is the next thing you should do? The next thing you should do is look for a uterus. Is the uterus absent or present? So that's the next thing. The next thing is the presence or absence of uterus. If the uterus is absent, then you will do a karyotype. Okay, so next investigation, bahut pushte. next investigation, best investigation. Okay, next question. 16-year-old girl with well-developed secondary sexual characters and ovary as the gonad. The, it's given ki ovary hai uske paas and well-developed secondary sexual characters. However, the uterus is absent. Okay, so what are we dealing with? Anyone? So she has the ovaries. Okay, she has secondary sexual characters, but the uterus is absent. So this has to be the only two things which could it could be right. It could be MRKH or melanogenesis or AIS. It is not AIS because it's given that the gonad is the ovary, right? So this is mullerian agenesis. Okay. Next, 24-year-old woman is being evaluated for amenorrhea. You order a hormonal profile, which is the correct match. Okay, so let's see this. This is not primary. This is actually secondary amenorrhea, but we put it here. Okay, so let's see. In POF, what will happen? Premature ovarian failure, mein kya hota hai? ovary ka function kam ho jata hai before the age of 40. That is the definition of premature ovarian failure. Less than 40, ovaries stop functioning. If ovaries are not functioning, what will happen? Estrogen will go down and FSH will go up. So let's see that option is there. Estrogen down, FSH and LH go up. Okay, this should be the correct option. Asherman, mein kya hota? what is Asherman? Asherman is intrauterine adhesions. Okay, so a lot of adhesions inside the uterus. So what will happen? Everything else will be normal. The only reason why she is not bleeding is because of an outflow tract problem. So everything should be normal in Asherman. FSH, LH, estrogen, everything is normal. PCOS, mein kya hota? very important in PCOS. LH to FSH ratio is altered. Normally, kya hota hai? FSH, LH se zyada hota hai. Thik hai? PCOS mein kya hota hai? LH to FSH becomes 3 is to 1. That is the ratio. LH increases and more than FSH. Okay, so this is the correct answer. LH has increased. Estradiol levels usually remain normal. Sheehan mein kya hoga? Sheehan is a pituitary problem. So FSH LH will be low and estrogen also level levels will be low. That is the correct option. So this is another type of question you can get. Okay, which would be defined as primary amenorrhea? A girl presenting with not attaining menarche with age and breast tanner staging of what? Now, tanner staging kya hota hai? So for breast, for pubic hair, for axillary hair, there is tanner stage 1 to 5 where one is undeveloped and five is fully developed. So they're basically asking you the definition of primary amenorrhea, right? So a girl coming at age 11 with Tanner stage one, is that primary amenorrhea? No, because by age 11, you're just, she's just starting to develop her secondary sexual characters. They may be absent. So this is not the definition. Age 14, she comes to you and she has absent secondary sexual characters in Tanner stage one. Then she's primary amenorrhea. Yes, if we follow the definition of 13 years with the absence of secondary sexual characters, it fulfills the definition. Age 12, if she comes to you with well-developed breasts, yes, standard stage 4, okay, this is again not the definition because you expect her to, to have here, you can wait till the age of 15. Same here, you can wait till the age of 15. So this is the correct answer, okay. So that is about primary amenorrhea. Okay, if you have any doubts, you can message me. Secondary amenorrhea, I won't discuss much. We've already discussed Sheehan. We've discussed Asherman. We've discussed premature ovarian failure. These are the most common causes. Fragile X premutation also, remember, can premutation can also present as premature ovarian failure. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions you can ask me now before we move to the next topic? 13 is the lower limit, yes. So uh, what is the doubt? 13 is the lower limit, yes. So 13 
in the absence of secondary sexual characters, you will define as primary amenorrhea or 15 in the presence of secondary sexual characters, you will define as primary amenorrhea. Okay, let's move forward. Now, important points in infertility. What are the tests for ovulation? So, there are two things. One is test for ovarian reserve. This is confused. And one is test for ovulation. Okay, both are different. Both have come as questions. Test for ovulation, mein kya -kya karoge? Test for ovulation, what will you do? One is based on her history. If she's having a regular 28-day cycle, that means she is ovulating. Or if she's having ovulation pain mid-cycle, she is ovulating. What are the other tests that can tell us that she is ovulating? Serum progesterone on day 21 of the cycle. If it is more than 10 nanogram per ml, it is an indication of that she is in the luteal phase, that she is ovulating. Okay, what else? Yes, so you have all these tests, basal body temperature test, okay, cervical mucus test, okay. These are again tests which again are come in natural contraception also. These again are signs that she is ovulating. Also, another test we can do is urinary LH, okay. So first what happens, serum LH rises just before ovulation and that is depicted 24 hours later by in the urine. So urinary LH positive is again a sign of test of ovulation. What else? Beta HCG is not a test of ovulation. LH levels, progesterone levels, then ultrasound. So ultrasound, you can actually see the follicle forming. Okay. So when we do a follicular imaging, we can see the follicle forming on uh, mid-cycle and rupturing. We can also see the endometrium. So the endometrium changes from what is called a trilaminar, triple line endometrium to a homogeneous endometrium in the secretory phase. So these are the tests of ovulation and these are different from the tests for ovarian reserve. This is important hai because these questions both have come. Ovarian reserve basically means how many follicles are there in her ovaries. With age, what happens? Follicles reduce in number. So when a woman comes with infertility, especially if she is her age is more than 30, 35, we need to know to decide or prognosticate what is the chance she will get pregnant and to decide her management. Okay. So ovarian reserve will tell her that tell us the tests that tell us the amount of follicles left in her ovaries. What are these tests? The first thing is we do an ultrasound and we count the follicles, what is called an antral follicle count. It is done on day two or day three of the cycle. We count the number of follicles in both the ovaries. If they are more than six in number, okay, then we say it is normal. Okay. What else? We can also do a AMH level. What is AMH? Anti-Mullerian hormone. This has come as a question. Anti-Mullerian hormone is a test of ovarian reserve. It is secreted by small, the pre follicles. Okay, and anything more than one is normal. What are the other tests we can do? We can do a serum FSH on day two or day three. That means early menstrual cycle when she's on day two or day three, we do an FSH level. If it is high, it is a sign of low ovarian reserve. And similarly, a serum estradiol at the same time, day two or day three. If it is high, Okay, not low. If it is high, it is again a sign of poor ovarian reserve because FSH zada hai, wo follicles ko stimulate kar hai, zada estrogen produce karne ke liye. So high levels of estrogen on day two, day three are not a good sign. They are a bad sign. Okay, so serum FSH, very good. Avinash, serum AMH, FSH, estradiol and antral follicle count. These are the four tests of ovarian reserve. You can add one more here, clomiphene citrate challenge test okay this is just to complete the list this is a test where uh, we, we, where we do fsh levels before giving clomiphen then give five days clomiphen and we do fsh levels after if the levels are very high then again it is a, a sign of poor ovarian reserve okay so clomiphen challenge citrate challenge test is also just to complete the list this has come as questions several time in the past especially anti mullerian hormone remember it is not a test of ovulation it is a test of ovarian reserve tubal patency ke liye hum kya karte? two main things you should know are hsg and a laparoscopic chromo 
ट्यूबेशन ओके एच एस जी एंड लैप्रोस्कोपिक क्रोमोट्यूबेशन दिस इज द गोल्ड स्टैंडर्ड वेर यू आर एक्चुअली पुटिंग इन अप्रोस्कोप एंड सींग इफ स्पिल इज देयर ऑफ द डाई और नॉट एच एस जी विल गिव इन डायरेक्ट एविडेंस लैप्रोस्कोपी विल गिव डायरेक्ट एविडेंस दीज आर एच एस जी पिक्चर दिस इज अ नॉर्मल एच एस जी ओके दिस कैन कम एज इमेज बेस्ड क्वेश्चन वेर द स्पिल इज सीन here you can see there is a corneal block on one side one side is normal here you can see there there, there is hydrosalpinx with fimbrial block on both the sides okay so these can all come as images they can say patient with infertility comes and this is the hsg what is your diagnosis okay this is a distal or a fimbrial block leading to hydrosalpinx this is how the laparoscopy will appear this is the so what is the dye used we use methylene blue Dye we injected through a Leach Wilkinson cannula. So Leach Wilkinson HSG may be used. होता है. इसमें भी used होता है. It's basically an instrument to inject the dye. I think I have an image. We will see it here. Okay. There are some other tests which are also used. One is hysteroscopic cannulation and phalloposcopy, and something called HYCOSY. Also noted in here is a sonosalpingography. Just to complete the list. Okay. For uterine factor, sorry. What do we do? We do ultrasound, which is the best way to see the uterus, or we can do a hysteroscopy to look inside the uterine cavity. Dye used is the methylene blue dye. Okay, semen analysis for this you should know. Okay, uh, it's been this is actually two thousand twenty one or two thousand twenty. Slight change in the parameters have have been described. in the last few years okay so this is a potential question remember pehle we used to say oligospermia less than 15 million now it is 16 million that is the change okay we used to say if that there is if there is poor motility okay it is or asthenospermia if it is less than 40% total or less than 32% progressively motile now it is now it is 42% and 30 to so 2% either add kar diya और इधर टू परसेंट सब ट्रैक कर दिया सो फोर्टी टू एंड थर्टी इज द न्यू चेंज ओके एंड रिमेम्बर मोर्फोलॉजी इज द सेम ओके दिस इज नॉट वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट मोर्फोलॉजी यूज टू बी फोर परसेंट नॉर्मल स्पर्म लेस दैन दैट इज कॉल्ड एस टेराटोस्पर्मिया इट इज स्टिल फोर परसेंट सो रिमेम्बर द मेजर चेंजेस आर इन द टोटल काउंट पहले फिफ्टीन था अब सिक्सटीन हो गया अब फोर्टी से फोर्टी टू हो गया और थर्टी टू से थर्टी हो गया प्लस टू माइनस टू हो गया ठीक है What is normal spermia? Everything normal. Oligospermia reduced count. Azoospermia absent sperm. Aspermia kya hai? Aspermia is absent semen. Okay, unable to ejaculate. Absent semen is aspermia. Asthenospermia is reduced motility. And teratospermia is reduced morphology. And oats is Oats is all of them. Oligo, asthenio, terato, zoospermia. So when somebody says presents with oats, oats means all of them. Oligo spermia, asthenio spermia, and terato spermia together is called as oats. Okay. So if we have anovulation, what will we do? Okay. If the ovary is a problem like PCOS, we will give ovulation induction. Okay. What is super ovulation? Super ovulation is in a woman who is ovulating. We want to Enhance her chances of getting pregnant. It is called as super ovulation, and COH is used in IVF cycles. Okay, so ovulation induction is the term used in women who are not ovulating. Super ovulation is the term used in women who are ovulating, but we want to increase their chance by give, making more follicles. And COH is the term used in IVF cycles. Okay, now importantly, what are the drugs we use? What is chromaffin citrate? It is an anti Estrogen. So, what does it do? It reduces the level of estrogen in the body. So, when a positive feedback goes, FSH LH levels increase, and more estrogen is produced, and that recruits multiple follicles. So, remember, multi-follicular development is a feature of clomiphen citrate. Okay, mm -hmm. mono-follicular development is a feature of letrozole. So, if only one follicle you want to be formed. you want to reduce the chances of twin pregnancy give her letrozole okay and this is the mm -hmm. drug of choice in pcos it is an aromatase inhibitor 
So with clomiphene, you will see more of twin pregnancy. With letrozole, you will have mono follicular. Only one follicle will form and grow. And it is, uh, again, the chances of twinning or multiple pregnancy is lesser with letrozole, more with clomiphene. <clears throat> you can also give gonadotropins if the cause is hypothalamic or pituitary. So hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, calmans with infertility. What will you do? There's no point giving them uh, the, the anti-estrogens or anything because there is no FSH LH. You have to give FSH injections. That is directly give gonadotropins for hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. What is this uh, image of? You can get this image, laparoscopic ovarian drilling. That means drill holes in the ovaries and this is done for PCOS as second line treatment. If they don't respond to ovulation induction drugs, then laparoscopic ovarian drilling can be tried where we drill holes inside the follicles. Okay. A little bit about PCOS before we go to some questions. Rotterdam criteria, mein, what are the three criteria? Two out of three criteria have to be there. Question. Okay. What are the two out of three criteria? One is an ovulation. Okay, or delayed ovulation. That means you'll present with delayed cycles. Secondly, what should be there? There should be hyperandrogenism. Okay, there should be hyperandrogenism, either clinical or biochemical. And third, there should be ultrasound morphology of polycystic ovaries. That means the typical necklace pattern should be seen on the ultrasound. That is, the follicles are arranged in the periphery okay so two out of any of these it becomes a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome okay so uh, we've already discussed most of these okay let's just go to some questions uh wait we'll just go to the questions and we will discuss the theory alongside alongside this okay So if any way get the PDF, most of it is discussed here. I want to go to the questions, jump straight to questions. Okay. A 55-year-old, so now we're discussing abnormal uterine bleeding. That is the topic we're discussing. A 55-year-old postmenopausal woman presents with vaginal bleeding. TVS reveals an endometrial thickness of 8 millimeters. What is the next step in the management? Okay, so what should we do next? So she has come with postmenopausal bleeding. What is the most common cause of postmenopausal bleeding? The most common cause is endometrial atrophy. Okay, or senile endometrium, a thin endometrium, the capillaries easily break through the surface. So this is the most common cause, but we are not worried about this. We are worried about endometrial cancer or endometrial malignancy. And so anywhere where the ET is more than 5 millimeter, less than or equal to 4 millimeter is normal in the postmenopausal age group. Anything more than 5 millimeter you will do a, we need to take a biopsy, okay? And the best way, the gold standard way of taking a biopsy is a hysteroscopic guided endometrial biopsy, okay? The other ways you can take a biopsy are by doing a DNC. You can also do an office endometrial aspiration, but the gold standard is a hysteroscopy. You won't take a pap smear because it's clearly given 8 mm biopsy. All these don't make sense. You have to take a biopsy. The most common cause of PMB is it is endometrial atrophy. Don't get confused. We do all the tests and investigations, but only 10% of PMB is because of endometrial cancer. 80% okay, is because of endometrial atrophy. All right. <clears throat> Next question. 56-year-old lady with PMB, postmenopausal bleeding, she attained menopause at 54 years. Why do you think they've given this? Is this a clue? Is this a clue? Yes, it is a clue. Is 54 years early menopause or late menopause? 54 is late menopause. We expect menopause to be by the age of 45 to 50. Anything more than 50 is late menopause. Early menarche, late menopause are risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia. Sorry, 
and endometrial cancer. Okay, so remember, read carefully. On examination, signs are stable. Uh, 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 abdominal examination is normal. Speculum reveals a normal looking cervix. Okay, what is the next best step? Okay, now I know this is a con this question is a little controversial. Many of you will say pap smear, but pap smear is not the answer. The next best step is what? What is the next best step? Because her, of her late menopause, okay, the answer should be a transvaginal scan. So she, you have a patient with postmenopausal bleeding with late menopause. On gross examination, the cervix looks normal. So we're not really worried about cervical cancer, right? Yes, pap smear can be taken, but the question is next best step. The next best step is we need to look at the endometrial thickness. If the endometrium is more than 5 mm, we then have to take a biopsy. That will be the next step. The first initial next best step is to do a TVS. If the ET is high, then we think of taking a biopsy. Okay, why we're not doing a pap smear? Because the clue has been given and they've clearly given a normal looking cervix okay so i hope this is clear the answer why not a yes a biopsy needs to be taken but in all women who come with pmb we don't straight do a biopsy we always first do a tvs to look at the endometrial thickness because the most common cause is an endometrial atrophy okay ten, only 10 percent will have endometrial cancer and we need to Screen out those women by doing a TVS. If the endometrium is thin, we're not worried. Okay, if the endometrium is thick, then we have to take a biopsy. So the question asked is the next best step. If this patient came to my OPD, okay, I will not directly say ki humme aapka biopsy lena hai. It's an invasive procedure. Remember, we have to first screen. Most common cause is atrophy. So we have to screen. So the next best step is I will send her for an ultrasound. I will say, go and get a TVS done. Let's see the ET and then we will decide whether biopsy needs to be taken. If the ET is less, okay, we can leave her alone. But if she has recurrent episodes, then again, we need to take a biopsy even if the ET is less. Okay, I hope this is clear. Okay, uh, you're asking important points related to PIH. This is gynae class. PIH, you can get go back to my obstetric class. It's on YouTube. On the channel, you can uh, see we've discussed PIH there. Okay. Staging of gynae cancers, I don't think it's important. Honestly, somebody is asking staging of gynae cancers important nahi hai, uh, because I've gone through questions. In fact, today I was reading gynae onco and I was going through the previous year questions. Mujhe bohat zyada nahi mila in the last three years where a question has come on staging per se. But in oncology, you have to read cancer cervix, uh, uh, precancerous lesions of the cervix and cancer screening for CA cervix. That's very important. Cervical cancer screening is very, very important in oncology. If you are short for time, leave out the staging and concentrate on cervical cancer screening. That is very, very important. Okay. Next question. Body year old woman presents with HMB and endometrial biopsy reveals simple hyperplasia with atypia. What should you do? So whenever there is atypia, that means the risk of endometrial cancer is high Okay, in the future. So what should you do? You should do a total abdominal hysterectomy. If it was without atypia, you can give her progesterone or put in a marina. But if there is atypia, you remember this. Remember simple hyperplasia the risk of malignancy is 1%. This is without atypia, okay? Complex hyperplasia, risk of malignancy, progression to malignancy is 3%. But simple with atypia, the risk becomes 8%. And complex with atypia, the risk becomes 29%, okay? Ye undergraduate day se mujhe yaad hai because our professors used to say, this is so important, it's so important. It's actually very important because questions come on this. In these types, you will have to do a hysterectomy, okay? In these types, you can manage with progesterone, okay? Okay, uh, any questions before we go further? Okay, so quick some images. What is this? This is adenomyosis. How do we know? It's a globular diffuse 
enlargement of the uterus what is the definitive management definitive management management is a hysterectomy how would this woman present she would present with heavy menstrual bleeding and dysmenorrhea okay this is how a normal uterus looks like on the ultrasound these are tvs images this one is normal you can see the trilaminar endometrium triple line endometrium okay and these are abnormal uteruses okay these are adenomyotic how can you make out you can see how bulky it is the there is asymmetrical thickening of the myometrium okay here you can see this is also a bulky uterus and the endometrium is not clear at all and here also you can see here there is in fact endometrial hyperplasia also the endometrium is thickened okay and you can see this this is black area is an endometrial cyst which is again seen in adenomyosis okay these are possible image based questions usually a clinical scenario will be given okay images of fibroid what is this red degeneration typical presentation will be in pregnancy what will she present with she'll present with pain with constitutional symptoms like fever okay what will you do you will what will you do you will manage her conservatively you will not do a myomectomy remember they will give you a very sinister looking situation they will say pain not responding to anything what will you do you will not do termination of pregnancy you will not do an mtp you will not do a surgery you will just manage her conservatively with analgesia and antibiotics just a second is there any noise disturbing you my dog is making some noise is there any noise or we can continue okay how to do last minute revision for gynae obs as it's the most important subject for the exam previous year those are the high yield topics okay so three hour lecture of obs you can go through of mine and this lecture also you will be good to go these are the high yield areas these are high yield topics okay quickly quick quick revision if you go to my youtube channel okay you will find one 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 and a half minute shorts of important topics okay or previous year questions discussed okay you can go through those okay or if you've had your notes just remember focus on the previous three years what has been asked hardly any time is left okay what is this what is this an image of this is a bonnie myomectomy clamp okay this is done this is done in myomectomies when you're doing an abdominal myomectomy to reduce the bleeding remember fibroid myomectomy removal of the fiber is a very bloody surgery there's a lot of blood loss okay and this clamp it is put at the level of the uterine arteries this reduces the blood loss it's called a bonnie myomectomy clamp this is a picture of a myomectomy being done okay this is this is a laparoscopic myomectomy okay this is the incision given on the uterus and this is the fibroid which is being taken out okay so the fibroid appears white in color okay and this is the uterus behind this is the fibroid being taken out this is a hysteroscopic view of a sub mucus fibroid i'm showing you these images because they can come pale polyp they've asked they can ask you a fibroid also how would this woman present with she will present with heavy menstrual bleeding or even intermenstrual bleeding so the question can come a woman with hmb a hysteroscopy is done this is seen what is your diagnosis this is a sub mucus fibroid a fibroid in the cavity of the uterus okay okay uh let's just go okay so here you have this is important functional ovarian cysts is important when we talk about benign ovarian cysts we have different types one is functional functional means it is either a follicular cyst or a luteal cyst what do you do you manage them if they are more than five centimeters in size some books say six centimeters then is an indication for surgery if they are less than that they can be left alone nothing needs to be done so see the question if this if they are symptomatic then they need to be removed other or if they are more than six centimeters in size otherwise they are to be left alone okay what is this this has come as an image based question several times this is a teratoma or an ovarian dermoid it is the most common 
tumor ovarian tumor in pregnancy typically how do we know it's a dermoid you can it has it has cell lines from all parts okay so you have hair you have teeth typically usme hair dekhega if you get a question so it is most it is very commonly seen in pregnancy and a very common presentation is torsion so if your question comes as ovarian torsion expect it is a dermoid why because it has sebaceous material which is very light the ovary floats on top and it can twist if it undergoes torsion what do you do you do a surgery laparoscopy detort it and do remove the cyst okay so dermoids very classically present two things in pregnancy they commonly present and they commonly present with ovarian torsion this is an ultrasound picture showing an endometrioma what is an endometrioma it is a chocolate cyst okay that is endometriotic cyst of the ovary on ultrasound you see this fine appearance this is basically stippling okay which is typically seen in the ultrasound okay what is risk of malignancy index now when you have an ovarian tumor okay how do we know if it's benign or malignant by calculating the risk of malignancy index okay so the rmi is basically three things we multiply this level of ca125 which is a tumor marker for epithelial ovarian cancer into the age of the patient so if she is pre menopausal we give a score of 1 if she is post menopausal we give a score of 3 into ultrasound scoring so there are five things we see on the ultrasound we see solid areas we see whether it is multilocular we see whether there is metastasis ascites or bilaterality that means both sides the ovaries are involved or not and we give a score of either 0 1 or 3 based on this okay if the score is more than 200 it is suggestive of malignancy okay so this is the rmi score and there is another score which has now come called the iota scoring just remember the name iota scoring is another new scoring system which has come so rmi and iota scoring are for malignancy determining the malignancy index okay next question this is from 2020 neat pg 18 year old girl with a history of low grade fever weight loss pain and amenorrhea for 6 months on examination a pelvic mass is felt on the left side and signs of ascites are positive what is your diagnosis okay so i think we can safely rule out ectopic pregnancy okay because it doesn't look like ectopic pregnancy it also doesn't look like sub mucus fibroid because why would they be amenorrhea okay so our main are these two so what do you think this is this is a genital tuberculosis okay which typically presents very commonly you can get confused with with um, ovarian malignancy the points in favor of tb are her age okay younger age okay fever weight loss pain amenorrhea so amenorrhea is typically seen amenorrhea you won't see in an ovarian malignancy okay ovarian malignancy will may cause abnormal uterine bleeding especially if you're seeing a granulosa cell tumor where there's estrogen that girl can have menorrhagia amenorrhea is rarely seen so here this is tuberculosis okay now let's uh quickly I just want to go to some questions. Okay, what is this image? What is this image of? Anyone? Okay, we'll start with this first. This is very important. This has come as a question. Tumor markers, then images of the ovarian tumors. CA one twenty five is seen in epithelial ovarian cancer. AFP is seen in. Is a tumor markers marker for yolk sac tumor. LDH for dysgerminoma, beta HCG for chorio carcinoma, and inhibin B for granulosa cell tumor. So this is very very important. Match the following. It can come on it. PG it can come otherwise also. Okay, this is very very important. Just a second. Okay, what is this? What is this? I think you've got. I've got some answers. This is Schiller 
active wall body where you have a central capillary surrounded by cells. Okay, what is this? This is an image of Col Exner cells and coffee bean nucleus. These are typically seen in the granulosa cell tumor. So Col Exner cell is seen in granulosa cell tumor. Coffee bean nuclei also seen in granulosa cell tumor. Okay, what are these? Anyone? Okay, good, good, good. Choreogranulosa cell, call Exner, very good. What is this? Okay, this is this is a dysterminoma. Okay, wh why is this a dysterminoma? Can you just give me a second? I'll just just excuse me for a minute. Okay, I just went to to get my charger. Okay, so this is okay. So right, this is not actually a dysterminoma. Okay, this somebody has written the correct answer. This is a signet ring cell. Where is the signet ring cell seen? Can you see this ring with the signet ring cell? These are seen in Krukenberg's tumor. Okay, signet ring cell is seen in Krukenberg tumor, which is an ovarian metastatic tumor. Okay. Then what is this? What are these? These are samoma bodies. These are seen in epithelial ovarian cancer, especially the serious type. Okay, so these histopathological pictures are important. You will obviously be given other clues also most of the time. And uh, just a second. Yeah, sorry, sorry for the confusion. Okay, so Krukenberg, signet ring cells, samoma bodies, serous epithelial ovarian cancer. Okay, what is Meek syndrome? When you have a fibroma, that is a solid ovarian tumor, plus pleural effusion, plus ascites. Okay, so Meek syndrome typically was described for fibroma. Pseudo Meek syndrome, remember, okay, pseudo Meek syndrome, remember, is for any other ovarian tumor or fibroid with pleural effusion with ascites. So, pseudo Meek is any other ovarian tumor with pleural effusion with ascites is pseudo Meek. Meek is typically for fibroma. Okay, I think there's a lot of theory in this. Let me directly go to the questions because that is what we need to be discussing. Okay. Okay, uh, just give me a moment. All the questions are here. Yeah, all the questions start now from here. Okay, let's discuss mm -hmm. this. This is NEET PG 2021 question. A 25-year-old woman had evacuation of a molar pregnancy done six months earlier. She now presents with general ill health, breathlessness, cough, and irregular bleeding. On chest x-ray, there are cannonball metastases and her beta HCG levels are high. What is the best management option? Okay, now here you have a case of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia and what all is given here? Okay, look at the clues. Her age is given. So these are, we are now looking at the prognostic factors. Whenever you have GTN, Based on the prognosis, prognostic factors or prognostic score, we decide whether we need to give her which chemotherapy. Now, remember, GTN is treated primarily by chemotherapy. Okay. And the most common drug we give is methotrexate or single agent chemotherapy, which is given in multiple doses. Okay. Or we give multi agent chemotherapy, which is called as EMACO. So, based on the prognostic score, we decide the treatment. Now, the prognostic score described by various bodies like WHO and FIGO and other things, the main features they see are the age. If she's young, less than 40, if it is following evacuation of a molar pregnancy, remember GTN can happen after 
and abortion after a term pregnancy also those are bad if it's after a molar it's a good sign if it's soon after within six months after it's again a good sign okay on x-ray they are cannonball meds that means there is lung metastasis remember lung metastasis is actually not a bad sign okay it is there to confuse you lung metastasis is actually a good sign in prognostication lung metastasis gets a lower score brain and liver meds get a higher score lung metastasis are very common in choriocarcinoma so they are given a lesser score so if you see all of the factors even if you don't know the scoring system all of the factors seem very very favorable so if they seem favorable if the score is low then the option should be multi-dose single agent chemotherapy so with methotrexate we give it usually on day one three five and seven and alternate with in polynic acid or rescue dose so that normal cells are not destroyed okay so imaco that is imaco is given if the prognostic score is more than or equal to seven that becomes a high risk uh, choriocarcinoma okay so remember these these are how cannonball metastases look like you can see these lesions here in the lung okay these are typically a good thing okay they don't worsen the prognosis remember this so lung metastases are good management is based on staging and the prognostic score if you see the prognostic score again you don't have to remember it you just should remember which are the good prognostic things less age is good if it's following a mole it's good if it's soon after the evacuation or the delivery it's a good sign if the beta hcg levels are low less than 1000 or less than 10000 it's a good sign if the largest if the tumor size is small it's a good sign if the number of meds are small or less it's obviously a good sign now see site of meds lung is actually given a score of 0 okay that's how good it is okay so remember lung metastasis is actually a good thing don't get confused by it many of you got confused and got this wrong here you will give if you even if you don't have all the parameters this is pointing to a low risk choriocarcinoma and you treat it by giving single dose chemotherapy in multiple doses okay now remember there's also a staging system stage one is when it's confined to the uterus two is when it's in the pelvic area three is when it's gone to the lungs and four is when it's in the brain or the liver metastasis is gone there so if it is stage four this again becomes a direct indication for giving a maco okay in these three if it is low risk you will give methotrexate okay only if it's high risk will you give a maco okay i hope this is clear okay now some images in gynae we've already discussed this this is a teratoma mature teratoma or dermoid what is this picture showing this is a laparoscopic image of what is this What is this? Okay. Somebody is asked Krukenbergs. Okay. But let's just skip this. Krukenberg is basically bilateral, usually bilateral ovarian tumor, which is because of metastasis, most commonly from a stomach cancer. So stomach cancer, if it's there, if you find a woman with stomach cancer and ovarian mass is bilateral, it is usually a Krukenberg's tumor. It can also be following breast cancer also. Okay, so it is a metastatic tumor of the ovary, not a primary ovarian tumor. On histopathology, you classically see the signet ring, which was there. This is how the image would be. These are the, this is how the cells will be. Okay, what is this? This is showing torsion okay and as i said the most common ovarian cyst to undergo torsion is a dermoid cyst why am i saying torsion because you can see how the pedicle is twisted here multiple times okay and dermoids commonly undergo torsion okay yeah. what is this an image of we've already seen this see the chocolate material coming out this is endometriosis okay classical Description 5D is dysmenorrhea, dyschezia, dysperunia, dull aching abdominal pain and disfertility. 5D is of endometriosis. Okay. What is this? This is a HSG picture. This is quite clear. This is showing hydrosalpings on both the sides. Now, how will hydrosalpings look on an ultrasound? This is an ultrasound. It will appear as a can you see it's, it's, this is called a retort shape or a flask shape. 
this is called retort shaped structure so anything black on ultrasound is fluid so hydrosalpinx basically means fluid filled in the tube so this is a typical ultrasound picture showing a retort shape so you will have a woman with infertility or with features of pid and this is the image that can be given to you okay we've already discussed this quickly what is this this is a uniconvate uterus this is a didelphis completely separate cavities remember i told you they can show you only one leech will concern this is didelphis what is this biconvert because the interconal angle is obtuse and what is this septate because the angle is less than 75 degree okay this is very very important this these pictures okay hsg picture is definitely going to come what is this an hsg picture of anyone can tell me this one okay good good most of you are answering correctly what is this this one waiting This is an HSG picture. Both are HSG pictures. And what are, what are they showing? What is this one showing? What is this one showing? They are showing basically space occupying lesions in the uterus. So HSG is not, not only for the tubes, it is also for the uterine contour. And this is a submucous fibroid. Why? Because it is very well delineated. Okay. It's a space occupying lesion in the uterine cavity, which is very well delineated okay and this is a fibroid very good um dr t and this one is asherman syndrome why is this asherman syndrome because you can see it's an irregular filling defect which is typically called a flea bitten or a moth eaten appearance okay a moth eaten or a flea bitten appearance an irregular appearance of the inside of the uterine cavity a filling defect is called as asherman syndrome which is basically intrauterine adhesions how will ashermans present the typical presentation will be secondary amenorrhea or secondary infertility and typically or even secondary amenorrhea so typically after a history of a dnc they will come with secondary amenorrhea or secondary infertility next question all the following are advantages except okay so what is this this is a sims speculum okay we all know we have two speculums sims and cuscos the main difference is cuscos is self retaining this is not self retaining here i need to hold then i need to hold the retractor av anterior channel wall retractor it is not self retaining i can't leave it and take my hands off okay a cuscos is self retaining you put it inside you switch you screw the lock it will remain inside okay so this is a sim speculum not self retaining this is the cuscos this is self-retaining. Don't get these questions wrong. Okay, these are very, very simple questions. This instrument can be used in all of the following except where can't you use this? Okay, can you use it to visualize the cervix? Yes. Can I use it to take a pap smear? Yes. Can I use it to remove a copper T? Yes. Can I use it to do a caldocentesis? Caldocentesis, remember you do it in a suspected ectopic rupture. Okay, if you're not sure, you can put a needle in the posterior fornix and aspirate and see if there is blood or in an abscess, a pelvic abscess, put a needle, aspirate, see if there's pus. But with a cuscos, what is happening? My posterior vaginal wall is getting obscured. I can't <clears throat> see the posterior fornix if I put in this instrument. So I can't do a caldocentesis. This is done with a sim speculum. Okay, next question. What is this instrument? This is a Babcock's forceps. Right? Where do we use a Babcock's? To hold delicate structures because it is a non-traumatic or an atraumatic forceps. So in gynae surgeries, we use it to hold the fallopian tube when doing a procedure like a tubal ligation. Okay? Okay, clear? Next question. A 42-year-old woman is undergoing an endometrial biopsy for abnormal uterine bleeding. You are assisting the resident and you are asked to hold the anterior lip of the cervix with the instrument shown. What is the name of this instrument? What is the name of this instrument? Very good. This is a valsalam. So it's, it's a curved instrument 
with sharp teeth that's not seen here but anything used to hold the cervix of a non pregnant cervix uterus is called a is we use a valsalum we can also use a tenaculum okay which is also a toothed forceps okay identify this instrument and the procedure it is used in what is this this is an ovum forceps okay you can see the egg shaped at the end and very important it doesn't have a lock all the other forceps had a lock this one doesn't have a lock <clears throat> so it's an ovum forceps it is used in a dilatation and evacuation okay not a curettage curettage we use a curette here we use the forceps the the ovum to evacuate when we have an incomplete abortion so in cases of retained products of conception okay identify the procedure being done anyone anyone what is this okay anyone what is this this is l l e t z what is that large loop excision of the transformation zone okay and this is used it is an excisional procedure used in cin 2 and 3 <clears throat> where we want to remove this part okay of the cervix in cin 2 and in cin 3 okay we can also do a conization but this is not a picture of a conization this is a picture of large loop excision of the transformation zone okay what is this okay this is a myoma screw and we use it in when we're doing a myomectomy this gets screwed inside the fibroid inside the substance of the fibroid and by pulling it we're getting traction on it and we're able to separate the fibroid from the underlying uterine serosa so this is used in a myomectomy so about bonnie's myomectomy clamp and a myoma screw both are used in myomectomies what is this this is actually an obstetric question but i put it here what is this this is a green armitage forceps okay and where do we use a green armitage can you see the end the end is very wide there's a large surface area Okay, so it has a large surface area and it is atraumatic. It is flat. It doesn't have teeth. So what do we use it for? We use it when there's a lot of bleeding from a delicate structure. So when the cesarean section, the angles bleed a lot, sometimes they get extended into the uterine arteries. Okay, then we to hold the angles, we use a green armitage forceps. Okay, what else? Okay, next question. What is this? This is a new question. This has not been asked before. But this is an important question. This is a uterine manipulator. Okay. And there are many types available. This is one of the common types, most common, the commonly used ones. And this can come as a potential question. Where do we use a uterine manipulator? We use it when we're doing a when we're doing a laparoscopic hysterectomy. So a TLH. And this is very commonly done nowadays. We insert this part from below in the vagina. This part goes in the uterus. It acts, it helps us move the uterus. Okay, give traction on the uterus, whichever way we want to move it. So laparoscopically, we're able to visualize better. And this holds the cervix, the claws here. And this white part basically comes near the vaginal vault. Okay, so this is called a uterine manipulator. Okay. These are the other types. So that's why I'm saying that is one type. All these are different types of uterine manipulator. If you see this plastic thing here, a long plastic part, okay? It's usually made of plastic. This is, uh, these are uterine manipulators, different, different types. Okay. Identify the instrument shown here. I told you I have a picture of this. What is this? This has come as a question. What is this? This is, is this a hysteroscope? Is it an IUI cannula? Is it Leach-Wilkinson or is it a uterine manipulator? This is a Leach-Wilkinson cannula. Okay, this is Leach-Wilkinson cannula. Okay, and it has a lock here. It has screws at the end. It is used basically to inject dye during tubal patency tests. So in an HSG, in a laparoscopic chromotubation, we inject dye from here and that enters and 
the dye enters the uterine cavity. Okay, next question. A 44-year-old woman undergoes a DNC for abnormal uterine bleeding. Identify this instrument used in the procedure. What is this? What is this? This is... Okay, anyone? Okay, it's very easy. This is a good. This is a uterine curette. Okay, so it has a blunt end and it has a sharp end. The sharp end is used in gynae procedures like in an endometrial biopsy, taking a biopsy. And the blunt end is used in obstetric procedures like when you're doing a dilatation and curettage following an MTP. Okay. A 56-year-old lady presents with postmenopausal bleeding. On examination, a growth is seen on the cervix as shown. So you see a growth here. Which instrument should be used to take a biopsy of the growth? What should be used to take a biopsy from the growth? We should use a... Waiting for some answers. Okay, these are easy, easy questions but they're like a quick revision of all your images, okay? To take a biopsy, you will use a punch biopsy forceps, okay? So remember, whenever there's a growth on the cervix, there is no role of a pap smear, number one. Number two, we take a punch biopsy. And where do we take a, take a biopsy? From the center. Will we take it from here, the center? Or we, will we take it from the periphery? We will take the biopsy from the periphery periphery because in the center you may get just necrotic material and no cells will be visible so always take the biopsy from the periphery of the growth and remember there is no role of a pap smear if a frank growth on the cervix is seen this is how a punch biopsy forceps looks like okay so it could look like a straight forceps or it may be at an angle but the end is important okay it has a punch so it so it basically takes a punch from the growth okay this is a previous year question where the following instruments are used in which procedure the following instruments are used in which procedures it are they used in a cervical biopsy a colposcopy a dnc or a pap smear and these are basically if you see clearly here this is a cusco speculum okay and if you look here what is this this is a cyto brush okay so they are used in taking a pap smear. Very good. So in, if you don't have the IR spatula and if you want to take a liquid-based cytology, you use the cyto brush. So this is increasingly being commonly used even to take a sample for HPV. If you're testing for HPV, you, you use this. This is a cyto brush. This sweeps inside the os and the ectocervix also okay and then this is dipped in the liquid based media so both the lbc which is a replacement of pap smear and an hpv can be done from the same sample the following instrument was used in a 24 year old woman who wanted an mtp at eight weeks all are signs of completeness of the procedure except so when we're doing an MTP, at the end, we do a curatage, okay? And how do we know that the procedure is complete? We know it's complete by, number one, there will be grating sensation on all four walls. Number two, bleeding will stop. Number three, you will feel the os gripping your instrument and there will be presence of air bubbles, okay? They won't be absence, nothing, everything has come out. So in the end, you will see small, small air bubbles, bleeding will stop, nothing else comes out, okay? And that is how you know the procedure is complete. So four things, grating, presence of air bubbles, bleeding stops and gripping sensation over the instrument. A 19-year-old girl presents with pain. A diagnosis of ovarian dermoid is made. The image shows the surgical procedure being done which is, what is this procedure? Okay, somebody is asking me, pap smear, what is the fixative? The fixative used is 95% ethyl alcohol and ether. So a mixture of 95% ethyl alcohol and ether is used as the fixative. Okay, remember it is not formalin, it is 95% ethyl alcohol, okay? 
and ether, which is a combined mixture. It comes as cytofix or cytospray, which is either sprayed or in jars, you have the fixative poplix jars. We just dip the slide inside the jar and send it to the lab. What is this procedure? Is this, is this, this is not a laparotomy. So laparotomy is out. Okay. This is a laparoscopic view. Okay. And what are we doing? Can you see this incision has been given over the ovary and underlying kya hai? This is the cyst. So the cyst is being removed. So this is called a laparoscopic ovarian cystectomy. Okay. This is not an ovariectomy. Ovariectomy means removing the whole ovary. And hysterectomy means we're removing the uterus. And she's a young 19-year-old girl. Dermoid, what is the treatment of choice? And ovarian cystectomy is the treatment of choice. Okay. Menorrhagia, saline infusion sonography reveals the following image. Okay, what is the best management option? So first, what is it? And what will you do? Okay, what is this? This looks like a... What is this? It could either be a fibroid submucosal or it could be an endometrial polyp. So either way, you will do a hysteroscopy, see what it is and remove it. Okay, so a hysteroscopic polypectomy or a hysteroscopic myomectomy should be the answer. I haven't looked at the options. Let me look at the options now. It is not, we won't do a laparoscopy. We will definitely do a hysteroscopy. A hysteroscopic polypectomy is what has to be done. So this is all, this is, they've presumed it's a polyp. It could also be a fibroid. It's very difficult unless you have the Doppler to see whether it is a polyp or a fibroid. A polyp will have a single feeding vessel and a fibroid will have vascularity all around. Okay, but either way, you will do a hysteroscopy and either do a polypectomy or a myomectomy. Okay, previous question, what is this? A 26-year-old with tubal block on HSG undergoes a diagnostic laparoscopy. The following finding is seen. What is the diagnosis? What is this? This is Fitz-Hugh-Curtis syndrome. Okay. And Fitz-Hugh-Curtis syndrome is basically adhesions between the anterior abdominal wall and the liver. This is a picture of the liver, liver and these are flimsy adhesions called as violin string adhesions okay and these are typically seen in pelvic inflammatory disease PID so many very commonly in fertility you do a laparoscopy you find this or you have a patient with ectopic pregnancy you do a laparoscopy and you find this okay so this is Fitz Hugh Curtis syndrome very very commonly asked okay next question okay this was actually a video I just put it because this was an unruptured ectopic. You can see here, that's the ectopic. It had just was undergoing a tubal abortion. And you can see the adhesions. These are adhesions seen in PID, okay? And then because we suspected PID, I just turned my scope and I put it under the liver and this is what I saw, okay? It's a typical violin string appearance. This is one of my cases, which I did a few months back and it was a very, very beautiful appearance of the Violent string appearance. What did we do for this patient? What is the treatment of PID? We gave her Doxy and Metro, that is kit six, we gave her for two weeks. Okay. Next question. 18-year-old girl with delayed cycles and acne. A scan shows this. What is the best management option? 18-year-old unmarried girl. She has come with delayed cycles, with acne, with ultrasound features showing polycystic ovarian morphology. So this is, she has all the tri three criteria of Rotterdam. She is PCOS. What will you do? She doesn't want fertility right now. The best treatment for her would be lifestyle management and if you have to give a drug amongst these the best would be combined oc pills because she is complaining of delayed menstrual cycles okay so remember one of the aims is to get her a proper regular cycles along with lifestyle management for in the un in the younger group in the unmarried if she was married and wanting conception then you would give her letrozole as the drug of choice. Okay, LOD is only for those who don't respond to letrozole or clomiphene. Then we move to second line and we give them laparoscopic ovarian drilling. What is this? This is a question that has come many, many times. What is this? This is... <clears throat> this is good. This is varies 
needle okay where is needle is used to create the pneumoperitoneum in laparoscopic surgery so in laparoscopic surgeries we first put in the laparoscope okay and then we um uh, uh we first sorry create the pneumoperitoneum and then we proceed with the surgery so this is a varies needle okay 28 year old just answer this question i will just come in a minute Sorry, all my chargers are, yeah, okay. Right, so what is this? Painful swelling in the vulval region, which appears like this is a Bartholin. Very good, this is a Bartholin cyst. What will you do? What is the treatment of a Bartholin cyst? Is marsupialization, okay? And if it's an abscess, what will you do? You will do an incision and drainage and remove the Pus, and if possible, also do a marsupialization. That means give an incision here and suture the edges of the cyst onto the vaginal mucosa. That is a marsupialization. Okay, next question. Under the National Family Planning Program, the following contraception contains what? So this is anthera. This is injection depot medroxy progesterone acetate. It is given once every three months. Okay. And it is a type of long-acting reversible contraception. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the next question. A 42-year-old woman with a history of breast cancer is on tamoxifen. She presents with abnormal uterine bleeding and an ultrasound shows this. What is the next best management? Okay, the ultrasound shows this. What is this? This is the uterus. Okay, inside the uterus, what do we see? We see the endometrium. In the endometrium, is this normal looking or not? This is not normal. First of all, it is very thick. Secondly, can you see these cystic black spaces inside? This is typical of endometrial hyperplasia. Okay, and tamoxifen especially causes this appearance of cystic spaces. So tamoxifen is a risk factor for endometrial cancer. What should we do next? We need to take a biopsy and see what this is. And the best way to take a biopsy is by doing a hysteroscopic guided biopsy. Okay, so this is also right. This is also right, but we want the best way. They've asked the next best management is to put in a scope inside and take the <clears throat> biopsy. Okay. Okay, so that ends our session uh, for today. Okay. Uh, I hope this was useful. I will send across the PDFs tonight only. Okay. And you can go through the, I, what I skipped was a lot of um, theory in between, but that's important to just have a quick go through. Okay. And understand uh, uh, the important things. Okay. So there's a, a, a part of abnormal uterine bleeding, which I um, uh, didn't cover in too much detail. That's important. Okay, just go through that. But more or less, the rest has been covered. These are all the questions from 2020, 2021, 2022. And I've put in a lot of INI and FMG questions also, which I felt were important, especially primary amenorrhea. Okay, does anybody have any doubts before we end? Okay, thank you, everybody. Okay, types of abortion. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, let's quickly discuss types of abortions. So when we talk about types of abortions, okay, let me just find a blank slide where I can explain to you. Okay, when we talk about types of abortions, okay, let's talk about abortions. Okay, so first of all, what is the definition of abortion? It is when there is loss of pregnancy less than 20 weeks or when there's a loss of a fetus less than 500 grams. Now, in abortions, we basically have, okay, PDF I'll send you, I'll just send it across the cerebellum team and they will forward you the link on the Telegram group or the link will be shared with you somehow, okay, it will be put here, okay, thank you, Dr. T, 
uh, okay. So you can go through the, those who missed the OBS session, that's available on YouTube and the OBS PDF also I'll be sharing, okay? Now, remember in abortions, we have different types, okay? The first is threatened abortion, okay? Threatened abortion, the name itself suggests that there is a threat to abortion. Abortion hasn't really happened, but the woman will com complain of what? She'll complain of spotting, okay? She may have pain, okay? And when you examine her, you will find that the uterus corresponds to the period of gestation, okay? And the os is closed, okay? So your typical history will be a 20-year-old primary gravida at six weeks pregnancy comes with spotting, okay? And she has mild pain. When you examine her, you find that the uterus is six weeks size on bimanual examination. The os is closed. And the next thing you'll do is an ultrasound. In ultrasound, you'll find everything is normal. The fetus is alive. The fetus is viable, especially if it has crossed that period that is at six weeks, cardiac activity appears. The fetus is alive and everything looks fine, okay? That is a threatened abortion. What will you do? You will manage her conservatively, okay? You will advise her to rest. You will explain to her the risks, okay? But what will happen after threatened? The next step if abortion proceeds is inevitable abortion. In inevitable abortion, what happens? In inevitable abortion, what happens is that the process has started and now it cannot be stopped. What does that mean? She will have a little more bleeding. She will have a little bit more pain. Okay, the uterus will be the same size as the POG or maybe slightly lesser. Okay, more or less the same size because the products are still in size inside, but the os has now opened. So if the os has opened, you can't stop the process. The abortion will proceed. So it's inevitable. Ultrasound, what will you find? You'll find that the the gestational sac has come low down in the uterine cavity, okay? But that's why the uterus might be a little smaller, but it is more or less the same size. Typical history, kya hoka? Patient comes at 10 weeks pregnancy with spotting, uh, with bleeding and pain. And when you examine her, you find that the uterus is 10 weeks size and the os is open. When you do a scan, you find that the pregnancy is inside, but it is low down in the cervical canal. So this is inevitable abortion. If you don't do anything, what will happen? It will either end up in an incomplete abortion or a complete abortion. What is the difference? Incomplete bleeding will be present. Pain will be present. Uterus will be less than the period of gestation because the process has started and some products are still left inside. So uterus will be definitely less than the POG and the os will be open. Till everything comes out, the os will remain open. When you do a scan, you'll find retained products of conception inside. Okay. So what do you do in an inevitable and an incomplete abortion is you complete the procedure. You know she's going, she's aborting, help her. So what do you do? You do a, a suction and evacuation <coughs> or a dilatation. You don't have to do a dilation because this os is open. You just you have to evacuate the products doing a dilatation and evacuation or a dilatation and curatage. Okay. What is a complete abortion? How will the history be? So she will give a history of bleeding and passage of a tissue. Okay, she'll have history of pain, but when she comes to you, everything will be normal. She'll say, doctor, I had a lot of bleeding. I had a lot of pain. I felt something, some fleshy thing came out, but that was two hours back. Now everything is fine. I'm not bleeding. I'm not in pain. So that's how your clinical presentation will be. Your patient, the, the history they'll give you in the exam will be this history or will be there. Now patient is not bleeding. When you examine her, the uterus will be less than the period of gestation and the os will be closed. Okay. So that means everything has gone out and the os is closed. Okay. When you do a scan, you will find a normal ultrasound. The cavity is empty. Nothing is inside. Okay. And the fifth type is a missed abortion. What do you mean by a missed abortion? Is It is basically a fetus who has who is either non, not growing inside, okay, or has not developed, or it is a fetus whose cardiac activity has disappeared. So it's basically a fetal demise inside the uterus, okay? And what do you do? How do you diagnose this? She, she may or may not have symptoms. She may have mild spotting, mild pain, or she may be completely asymptomatic. Uterus will be slightly less than the period of gestation, depending on when she comes to you, okay? 
and when you examine her the os will be closed okay when you do a scan you will find that the fetus is not viable or there is no cardiac activity what will you do here you can either give her medical uh, do a, like a medical mtp you give mifepristone plus mesoprostol or you can do a dilatation and an evacuation okay so this is the types of abortion the questions if you see your previous year questions i think one question has come but not in the recent past maybe four five years earlier where the situation was very clearly given okay where the uterine i think it was a patient who had come with bleeding the os was open and the uterine size was the same as the period of gestation so that would be an inevitable abortion so see what's given the clues will fit into one of these categories okay and accordingly you will make a diagnosis and accordingly treat the patient okay yeah i will give the uh, pdf to the cerebellum team i'll tell them to post on the telegram channel okay avinash uh, uh, sterilization procedures are on my youtube channel it will take a bit more time uchida irving everything i've given is just a 5 minute video um uh, go through that everything is given okay so postpartum blues postpartum psychosis somebody is asked it's there in my obstetric but i'll quickly tell you postpartum blues and psychosis both present very early within 1 to 3 days of delivery but blues the symptoms are very mild she'll have tearfulness she'll and 80% of women have blues okay she'll have crying episodes and she will feel very overwhelmed she'll have insomnia she won't be sleeping okay but psychosis the symptoms will be very dramatic she'll be hysterical she will not be taking care of herself or the baby she will have feelings of infanticide okay so there'll be very extreme symptoms okay and there will usually be a history of um a bipolar disease or psychosis in the past if it is postpartum psychosis postpartum blues usually is very common very mild settles within 10 days of delivery okay that's all okay thank you very much i think we'll end good night and best of luck for neet pg those who are writing i hope this session was useful and i really hope you get questions from here okay thank you very much good night